You set foot on foreign soil. Only this land isn't ruled by any country or government. In this land, we celebrate music. In this land, we celebrate games. In this land, we celebrate those who compose video game music. Welcome to the VG Embassy. Embassy. everyone and welcome and thank you for tuning in to the inaugural episode of the VG Embassy. This is a brand new show centered around video game music and the amazing online community of fans and podcasters that enjoy it. Each episode, I, Ed, as your prime VG minister, will invite a guest VG ambassador onto the show to share with us their own video game music culture or share a part of my culture on a solo show. First of all, I want to thank Trevin Hughes, otherwise known as Dread, for the amazing theme song that he composed for this show that you're going to be hearing at the beginning of every episode. Uh, speaking of that, I will have a Patreon set up to support the show and these wonderful artists who are helping me. I'll be releasing details about that on a future show and on social media. So that brings me to my very first BG ambassador, fresh from the ocean and fresh from BGM Jukebox. Emily Keyglyph, welcome to the first episode of VG Embassy. Hello, thank you for having me here. I have been working on this show concept for a long time, and I've got a bunch of friends and guests lined up. You were the first one I reached out to uh, because I, as a show, I want to invite guests on to share their passion, their video game culture with us. And I know through listening to the VGM Jukebox for ages and ages and ages that you are a huge Echo the Dolphin fan, and uh, VGMJB doesn't really lend itself towards doing, like, themed episodes, so I figured you'd be interested in kind of talking about Echo the Dolphin and the music and that you'd have a whole lot to share with us. I'm so interested in talking about Echo the Dolphin and have been for my whole life that I've actually put friends to sleep while describing the story. <laughs> so... When you asked me if I wanted to come on and talk about Echo for two hours, I was like, yes, yes, I would like to do that. I am ready. I don't think this is going to be a sleepy episode at all. Get tucked got, in, everybody. We've got a lot of cool stuff. We've got a lot of interesting music, uh, a lot from the Genesis, some for the Sega CD, uh, the Sega Pico even makes a little appearance. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, all the way up to... We dug in deep. Yeah, for sure. I think every, every game is pretty much represented in some way. And we've got some interesting information from the developers and the composers. And we've got a special guest with us who might appear later on in the show as well. So uh, that should be an interesting and fun part to stay tuned for that. So let's kind of hop right into Echo the Dolphin, Emily. Why don't you kind of explain the basic overall plot about Echo, who Echo is, and why you love the game so much? Okay, well, Echo the Dolphin is a dolphin. He has a very special birthmark on his forehead that looks like a constellation in the sky, which is his birthmark of destiny because he's destined for great things. When you start playing the first Echo the Dolphin game, it feels like it's going to be a kid's game and just for fun. You're just hanging out in a lagoon, you're eating fish, you're talking to other dolphins that will say things to you if you send your sonar at them. So you get sort of lulled into this really nice place, this really a comfortable spot of complacency, and then something terrible happens. Um, a storm occurs and rips everything out of the lagoon, all life except you. So your family is gone, all the fish are gone, all of the shelled ones, as they call the clams and such life, gone. And then you embark on a quest to find out what happened. So you're immediately thrown into this really suddenly creepy situation. It's extremely jarring and you don't have the information to know what has happened. So it starts on a huge mystery point, and then the whole game is just kind of 
going from mystery point to mystery point to piece together the story to find out what has happened and then hopefully reverse it and restore your family to you. Yeah, my first experience with Echo was probably the same as most people. I thought it was a game more for kids or something. It just seemed to feel like a very peaceful kind of you wander through these levels and maybe solve a couple of puzzles here and there and then move on. And the more I learned about it, the more it like... I would hear people on the web talking about how creeped out they were by it <laughs> or just how, how difficult it was. And these are things that I didn't really equate to Echo the Dolphin. Right. So as I, you know, got older and started looking, you know, past into retro gaming and, and, and downloading the ROM for it and playing it on the computer, I was like, wow, this this is not easy stuff. And so that's when I kind of became more interested in the story itself. And I started hearing you talking about it on your podcast. So I really kind of wanted to learn more about it, and that's why I brought you on the show, so we could kind of discuss this, and uh, also the, the music, too, because I, I always thought it was just kind of ambient noise, mm -hmm. and there wasn't much to the music, but the more I kind of delved into the soundtracks, I found that there was a lot of really cool, unique pieces that you don't really hear music like this on the Genesis. No, it's very, very strange. Much. Yeah. And this, so, this game kind of keeps its cards hidden all the time. So it hides the fact that it's actually a super difficult game. It hides the plot from you. So it's kind of like something that I, I didn't realize when I was playing this game as a child, but I've come to understand as an adult, is I love games and I love narratives that sort of unpeel in layers. And this game is just layer after layer after layer. So it's you have to get into it to really kind of be rewarded with the gameplay, I think. And I think a lot of people stop at the first level or the second level because it's really, really difficult. That's totally legitimate, but if you push through, you're gonna find some really awesome stuff. Exactly, and so speaking of layers, a major part of those layers is the music and how that fits into the game and sets that kind of creepy atmosphere yep. sometimes. So let's start off with our first track and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the game itself. Emily, what have you picked for our opening track today? Okay, so the opening track I picked is The Lagoon from Echo One. Uh, the reason why I picked this is because this is the track that occurs right after this windstorm rips everything out of the ocean. So you drop back into the water and then all of a sudden this track comes in with the beginning blah. And this is when you begin to understand an inkling of what this game is going to be giving to you as you go through it. I think it really encapsulates the creepiness and the atmosphere that Echo is going for. So I wanted to start with this beginning shocking moment where you realize I'm really in deep into something that I wasn't <laughs> expecting. And so the soundtrack to the first Echo game was composed by Spencer Nielsen, Brian Coburn, and Andras Maghiari. All right, well, let's take a listen to the first track. The Lagoon. The Lagoon, let's hit it. Right, that was The Lagoon from Echo the Dolphin, composed by Spencer Nilsson, Brian Coburn, and Andras Maghiari. And yeah, quite quite a creepy track there. Yes, I love that it starts with that Genesis. Wow, that FM sweep. <laughs> so yeah. good. Something I think is really interesting about the beginning of this game is that at no point are you really explicitly told how to trigger the storm, because this is a video game. You actually trigger the storm. You can spend as much time as you want in the lagoon just chilling, which I know a lot of us did back in the day. Mm -hmm. But in the manual, the manual kind of says, eh, you know, 
Maybe you should try jumping really high in the sky, but it's not directly given to you. There is a dolphin in the game who says, how high in the sky can you fly? So sometimes you're kind of encouraged to jump. I'm assuming people figured this out on their own. I did not figure it out on my own because the first time I played this was at a friend's house. And my friend Mike said, hey, you should try jumping up in the sky. See how high you can go. And so he kind of tricked me into doing this. Ah. And I uh, obviously you need to do it to continue in the game. But when it happened, I had no idea what had happened. And dolphins are screaming. Stuff's being ripped out of the ocean. The, the sky is flashing red. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of freaked out. And I was like, why did you tell me to do that? <laughs> it's very unexpected. It is. Yeah, you have this nice little ocean full of friendly ocean creatures and then suddenly everything Ooh. just gets swept out literally from under your dorsal fin and uh yep. and you're kind of left in this empty space and and then you're, you there's nobody to talk to there's no Correct. there's nothing the game does not handhold you at all so right. you are kind of left to your own devices to figure out what to do next something that i love to do when i play the game now after the storm hits is to there's a a function in the game where you use your sonar to generate a map of your surroundings, which you really have to lean on in the game to be able to make your way around because it gets very maze-like, labyrinthine later, and you have to kind of plan where enemies are. Something I love to do to just kind of like get, get those chills going after the storm hits is to use my sonar in the home bay that was filled with things before and just see empty, yeah. completely empty map just kind of brings it all home and yeah, lets does. you realize how, how big of a space is just now kind of unpopulated. Yep. So this music is playing while you're in that kind of unpopulated yes, space. Yes, correct. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of empty space in this music. There's a lot of very just like one kind of sustained instrument kind of left on its own for a little while. You've got these really kind of weird metallic yep. sounding like chromatics in the, in the right ear. Uh, and every so often, a little bass lick. Yeah, exactly. Those bass licks remind me a lot of uh, one of my favorite games in the Genesis, Flashback. They have those little doo 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 kind of like mm -hmm, bass mm -hmm. licks here and there. Um, but this one plays a little more often than than the incidental music in Flashback. But I don't know. This I guess this music really kind of cements the feel for Echo. It kind of introduces you to what you're going to be experiencing as you go through the game. And I think they did a really good job in kind of introducing that. Right, that they give you a little tiny taste. You have no idea how bad it's going to get, but you <laughs> feel like, okay, we're definitely trending down yep, right now. Yep, absolutely. Something I did want to mention about the atmosphere, just real quick. Um, there's somebody that I follow on Twitter whose name is Sparky Luck Dragon, and they wrote uh, a blog post at some point comparing Echo to Metroid. And I just wanted to bring this up because I thought this was a huh. really fascinating comparison that I, I had never made. I've only started playing the Metroid games within the last few years. Um, but I think the way they described it was really beautiful. They said that um, Echo was the kind of thing you played if you had a Genesis or Mega Drive and wanted an experience similar to Super Metroid. It's no Metroidvania in terms of game design, though some of the levels are definitely very labyrinthine, but in terms of mood of the alien, an oppressive crushing in all around you, they're dead ringers for each other. Your protagonist is largely or wholly alone against a hostile world, working to unravel a mystery to stop terrible and powerful forces from destroying all that is good in beautifully realized environments with music that utterly nails the highs and lows of their adventures. Very interesting. That very, is cool very parallel. interesting, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess with, with Super Metroid, you have a little bit more of that traditional gameplay because you're you know, running and jumping and shooting, whereas, right. you know, in this, you're kind of... You're, you're able to go just about anywhere because you there's no gravity you know you're pretty much floating in water so the way they limit where you go is through other methods through right. like rock walls that block your path and right. stuff like that and then so. you have to get used to this uh physics mechanic of swimming in the water right there's no just different. turning around on a dime you're kind of like making loops and, right, and exactly. swimming like an actual dolphin does difficult le learning curve so i think um if if you'll be posting this in a blog by the way everyone this is the pilot episode Hi, pilot episodes are always the really <laughs> weird ones, uh, but uh, I will give you the link to this blog post so other people can read it if they want Absolutely. To, to see this comparison yeah, that would between be very cool. Echo and Metroid. We'll definitely put that in the show notes. Uh, all right, so a little bit of information about Echo's developer, because they, they play a very big part in all of the Echo games except towards the very end. Uh, so the original release date for Echo the Dolphin was on December 29th, 1992, and it was developed by a 
development house called Novotrade and published by Sega. Now, Novotrade was founded in 1982 in Hungary by company president Andras Cesar and CEO Stephen J. Friedman. Uh, they had a bunch of success in the European computer games market, and so they opened a few branches in the U.S. in 1989, and then they started working on some console titles. They renamed themselves Appaloosa Interactive in November of 1996, and by 2001 they had over 100 employees and 150 games to their name. They ceased operation in 2006 with the PS2 and Xbox game Jaws Unleashed, and some of the Novo Trade games you may have heard of include all the Echo console titles, Contra Legacy of War and the Contra Adventure, which weren't very good, but, you know, they're still popular. Uh, Calibri on the 32X, which has been hailed as kind of like a spiritual version of Echo that not many people have played. Yep, correct. Um, some hummingbird. Of the, yeah, exactly. It's basically Echo with a hummingbird. Um, some ports of RBI Baseball and Wacky Racers. So, they've had a good history, and we'll talk about them a little bit more as we go throughout the show and, and, and talk about Ed Anunziata, who was the concept developer and, yep, and producer creator. on the Echo games. Yes. So let's go into our next track of the show. Emily, what do you have lined up for us? Yeah, let's lighten it up a bit, I think. Sounds good to so, me. So something that the Echo games do very well, I think, is obviously we've been talking about being shocked into the gravity of the situation, but they do give you these very beautiful, hopeful moments kind of sprinkled in. So every so often you just feel like, oh, yes, okay, I can relax a little bit. You know, <laughs> I've made it, I've gotten far. And I feel like when I discovered this particular tune, it's called The Vents, and it's in the level The Vents, um, I remember just being very enamored of the tune. And something to note about Echo, the, f the first game, I think the second game as well, but definitely the first game, when you pause, the music keeps going. So when I first came across this tune, paused it and listened to it. For very long nice. time. That's the mark of a great VGM track. Yes, so this is um, definitely much stronger melody, not as ambient, and much more comforting. All right, so let's take a listen to The Vents, composed by Spencer Nilsson, Brian Coburn, and Andras Magyari, and when we come back we'll talk a little bit more about the composers and their careers. Right, that was The Vents from Echo the Dolphin, composed by Spencer Nilsson, Brian Coburn, and Andras Magyari. And this was the Genesis version of the game, I just want to obviously mention that, because we will be playing some music from Echo the Dolphin on the Sega CD later, which has some arranged CD tunes. Yeah, so, totally uh, different soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. So why did you pick this one, Emily? I picked this one because, well, first of all, it was so hard to pick tracks for this episode because <laughs> I was having a crisis on the way here. I was listening to all the soundtracks in the car and I was just like, you know, no, I got to change it. I got to play this other tune. I can't leave this one out. It's killing me to cut some of these out. But I picked this one because in the end, ultimately, I was trying to, to show all the different things that the games did. So I'm trying to give everyone a taste of all the flavors. So this is one of the melodic, sweet flavors in the game. Yeah, it's almost diametrically opposite to the original Lagoon track that yep. we played. Uh, this one, it, it feels very islandy. It has those it does, nice yeah. little pan flutes. And I wish that they kind of expanded on that pan flute section a little bit because that rolls right into the loop of the song. And then and the beginning of the song is a little bit dark and then kind of like gets brighter as it goes, which is cool. But this, this was one of my favorite tracks. I remember playing through the game and listening to this song and it just I felt like you know after the storm and, and all of your friends and family and your entire world gets taken away from you you're kind of like all right I'm making some progress here I'm moving along yeah maybe I got can, through the undercaves man maybe we can get some stuff done Huge you know accomplishment so I feel like maybe this at this point echo was feeling a little bit better about himself 
I will say that one of the, I will say that I should stop saying, I will say, <laughs> I think I've said that like five times. One of the things that did actually hook me on the game was the difficulty. I was very driven by making that progress. And that first day that I played it at my friend Mike's house and I got to the second level, he said, I can't get past this level. There's no way you can get past it. Mm. And so I was like, oh yeah? And kind of worked at it. Now, watching somebody play Echo the Dolphin is not the most riveting experience necessarily because it's very tedious. Yeah. But I did make it through the second level and kind of from that moment, I decided if I if I get this game, which I do want to get this game, that was the moment I decided I do want to own this someday. I thought, I'm going to be able to get through it. I'm going to really work on it. Yeah. Ed Anunziata was concerned about uh, Blockbuster. And yes, he was. rental games. Yes, he was. And he didn't want a game that somebody could rent on a Friday, play Saturday and Sunday and beat it, bring it back to the store and not go out and buy the game, you know, retail, because they wouldn't make any money off of that. That's so he specifically made the game kind of obtuse and kind of hard, and so he wanted people to not only have fun, but not be able to get as far as they feel they wanted to, and so that they would have to go back out and actually buy the game, and also to give them enough of an adventure where when they purchase the game, they feel like they've gotten their money's worth. Yes. So there are a lot of areas in this game where there is like a series of rocks that are blocking your way, and the method to get past those rocks isn't always obvious and right there, and there's, there's no animal there that's going to tell you, hey, this is what you need to do to go solve this puzzle. So uh, you kind of have to poke around a bit and find out what you need to do to get through these uh, these little areas. So, so Emily, tell me a little bit about how Echo interacts with his world. What, what, what are his powers? What, what can he do to... Well, Echo, as a real dolphin, um, I can tell you about his real life in the ocean. <laughs> just like I <laughs> phrase that, like, tell me about dolphins. Actually, in the manual, there is an entire section that just has dolphin facts, which I think is pretty cool. That's cool. So how Echo gets around his world. So you can use your sonar, like we talked about before. That is for generating a, a very limited map of your surroundings. So... When you use your sonar and pull up the map, um, it's just a little glimpse of what's around you. It's further than you can see on the standard screen, but it's not too, too far. So you're still kind of kept in the dark about what's ahead, but it's very important to rely on the sonar. And I think that that might be one of the things that people perhaps don't learn to lean on and it's actually necessary to be able to yeah, to beat the game. I know playing it without the instruction manual, I didn't even know it existed because you have, oh, to, man. you have to hold down the button in yes. order to get it to work. Yeah. And so I was just kind of tapping the buttons and it shoots, shoots out like a little beam, yep. basically. And it doesn't really do too much except uh, allow you to talk to friendly creatures and then injure enemy creatures later on. Right. But um, yeah, without that sonar, lots and lots of people get lost in right. the game if they haven't you know, read the manual or anything like that. So yep, big absolutely. sticking point on that. That beam of sonar can also move some things around. There are levels where you're tasked with um, kind of moving creatures to other areas to do things and so on. And then yes, it does get more powerful later. You get superpowers in this game. This game is so great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. Um, but so you start with just basic sonar in the beginning. So map generation, moving things around and being able to talk to other animals as Ed mentioned. Then you have the charge, which is basically just ramming enemies or objects to injure them or destroy them. And then you also have the speed swim. So if you keep mashing on the C button, then you will gradually speed up with more control than when you actually just straight up dash. So the charging uh, mechanism is good for attacking and then getting out of places very quickly, but you don't have as fine control as you do if you speed up slowly with the speed swim. Exactly. Those are your basics. Yeah, those are the basics. That pretty much gives you a good indication of how Echo works uh, in this kind of like side-scrolling, free-flowing game. You know, oh, I forgot an important one. You can somersault if you jump out of the water if you press C. Right. Very important. Exactly. That gets you over a lot of different obstacles and such. Those Super Metroid parallels kind of break down when you when you do understand that Echo is more of a stage-based game. Yes. And that once you get to the next stage, you, you can't necessarily go back to a previous stage unless it's part of your storyline progression so you do play some areas a couple of different times right That's but in correct. different ways yes 
but it's not like Metroid where you can go from Brinstar to Norfair and then back to Brinstar just kind of Right, at it's not will. a giant open world. Yeah. You do have it is episodic. Exactly. But but it has that same ups. feel yes. of of Super Metroid. Yes, it does. So a little bit about the composers that made the music for this original game. Spencer Nilsson was a Sega employee from around 1992 to 1996. The Genesis version of Echo was the first title that he worked on. And when the Sega CD got released, he became kind of the de facto in-house composer for most of Sega's titles. So he worked on Echo the Dolphin CD, Batman Returns, Sonic CD, Amazing Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin, and the sequel to Echo, Echo the Tides of Time CD. He worked on a few Saturn titles upon its release in 1995, and he served as the executive music producer on Kong the Movie, The Lost City of Zinj. After he left Sega, he became the president of the Expression College for Digital Arts in California, and now he's currently the owner and co-founder of Illumina Studios, which is a media design and production company. So I read an interview with Spencer Nilsson, and he talked a little bit about his experience with uh, the Echo series, and I'll, and I'll kind of paraphrase here. So I guess Ed Annunziata, who was actually a good friend of Spencer's before he started working as a composer on it, came to him and said, there's nothing human in the game. There's no people, weapons, cars, or buildings, absolutely nothing. And he didn't want the score to sound like it was made by humans either. And so he wanted to know if they could do the same with the music. So Spencer hired two synthesis slash sound designers and he helped him create a large palette of completely original ocean-inspired instruments that they used to compose the tracks. The sounds they created were so inspiring and fun to write, and um, his good friend David Young helped him tremendously, both technically and musically, to bring the score to life. They had a huge setup with about 30 synthesizers and keyboards, along with amazing performances by live guitarists, percussionists, and wind players. So he originally created the music as live instrumentation in a studio, very similar to what you will hear on the Sega CD version as we get further into the show. And then, so I guess what happened was that Brian Coburn and Andres Maggiari afterwards sequenced the music onto a Genesis FM synthesis compatible format. At least that's what we're gleaning kind of from this It's a little confusing. Interview. Yeah. yeah, we were going back and forth about this because I'd always been under the impression, and this is complete assumption, I'd always been under the impression since the Genesis game came first that the Hungarian composers did most of the music and that Spencer Nielsen created this completely other soundtrack for the Sega CD title. Yeah. But it seems like it's a lot more interwoven than I just had assumed from my youth. So I think that I, I don't know how it worked. I would love to get in touch with them someday and actually find out. But it does seem like they were passing ideas back and forth and inspiring each other. And we'll go into it a little bit later. But if you listen to the other games in the series where Spencer Nielsen is or is not on a soundtrack, you can see overlaps with the main Echo games in a way that might kind of indicate who composed what in the main Echo games. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, exactly. I'm gesturing and making a Venn diagram that no one can see <laughs> right now. But She's ready to fly away over that's here. That's right. Yes. So uh, he, he went on to say he had a little bit of an advantage getting up to speed with the technology. But uh, he says 90% of what he did for Echo was full bandwidth Redbook audio, and he had a lot of help from programmers in Japan for converting his stuff into FM synthesis. So uh, a lot of the sounds in the Genesis version were an attempt by people in Japan and at Novatrade to take his full score on the CD version and make it approximated. So maybe, you know, it almost sounds like that when they did that is that when the Genesis version of Echo was coming out, they were already aware that they were going to be making right, a Sega which they CD. Would be, yeah. yeah. So it sounds like maybe this soundtrack had been written way before Echo even came out, and so they had enough time to both put it on the Sega CD version and also convert it into FM, so... Not every song on the Sega CD version is here, or vice versa, so there definitely are still these original compositions from these other two composers. Exactly. Which brings me to Brian Coburn. He was a Sega of America employee around the same time as Spencer. He mainly worked on sound effects and sound design, but also composed music for a few titles besides Echo, like Batman Returns on the Genesis, some of the Sonic Spinball Genesis music, and Gen War on the Saturn. And after he left Sega, he had a few credits as production and sound effects creator on Lord of the Rings Return of the King, Dungeon Lords, and his final game was Death Jr. in 2005. 
And uh, Andres Magyari was also a music and sound effects engineer. He started off at Epix Games way back in 1991, creating sound for California games. After that, he did one game for Konami, the Tiny Toon Adventures cartoon workshop on the NES in 1992. And that same year, he was hired on at Novotrade and began work on Echo and some of their other titles like Peter Pan, A Story Painting Adventure, Cyborg Justice, and Museum Madness. He also composed for Echo, Tides of Time in 1994, and continued with Nova Trade and their successor company, Appaloosa, doing music and effects for his last title, Contra Legacy of War, in 1996. So, um, both of these guys are pretty big Nova Trade guys. They've been with the company for quite a while, worked on a lot of their titles, and uh, considering that Echo was their first game, they kind of, you know, grew and expanded with that company. So, it's pretty cool. Yep. They really kind of brought uh, the Nova Trade sound to life. So speaking of sound and echo and uh, different versions of different soundtracks, that kind of brings us into our next track. So what do we got lined up? So next we're going to be listening to a track from the Game Gear game, the Game Gear installment of the first Echo game. This is Deep Water, and this was an original piece for this game. I didn't hear it anywhere else, um, and I thought that would be cool to kind of focus on the differences, at least a little bit at first. We might be doing some comparisons later, possibly. But, yep, this is Deep Water for the Game Gear. Cool. This was composed by Saba Gigor and Gabor Fultan. Let's take a listen. You guys are listening to Deep Water from the Game Gear version of Echo the Dolphin, composed by Saba Gigor and Gabor Foltan. I hope I'm getting those names pronounced correctly. They are Hungarian. I so know. If you're from Hungary, please forgive me. And, uh, and please you know, correct us. Yeah. I would really like to be able to do this Absolutely properly. correct us. So this is a track that you don't find in the original Echo the Dolphin, either on the CD or the Genesis version, right? I believe so. And it's pretty cool. It's it's actually quite long for a Game Gear track. And it, is. it feels I don't know. I'm trying to get like a good sense of, of the feel of the song. I feel like if I were a dolphin and I were swimming and listening to this song, <laughs> I would feel empowered mm-hmm. a bit. I guess it it, it's, it has a like a, a much more marchy feel to it than a lot of the other echo tracks that I'm familiar with. There's definitely with. a drive. There's an urgency here. Yeah. It's got like a very thick snare percussion going for it and some nice harmonized melodies over the top. And then it keeps going and then the melodies get a little more staccato and a little more complex as it goes and it's not just that a simple loop like we originally thought it was like maybe a 30 second loop or so but then right. it just kept getting a little more complex and a little more heroic sounding. So... I, I was kind of wondering what the composers might have been feeling when they were composing the song. What's interesting about this is that this one is called Deep Water, and the Deep Water 
level in the original game, I believe is where you meet the asteroid. So, so we know about the storm that has taken everything out of Echo's home bay. He goes on a quest to try to discover what has happened. He is told by an orca whale to seek out Big Blue, um, the blue whale, who is very wise. The orca thinks that Big Blue will be able to give Echo a clue. So you travel all the way to the Arctic regions, and you do finally meet Big Blue. When you do, you feel like you've conquered the world, but <laughs> you're not You're not even... Maybe you're halfway into the game? Not, not really sure. Probably about halfway. But you feel like you've really, really done something. So you have this really interesting conversation w- with Big Blue, where he basically... Every character that you meet in this game gives you some information, but it's incomplete. So we're going back to those layers again, where you're peeling layers. So Big Blue is able to tell you that these storms have happened before, that they occur regularly every 500 years, and that they pull all life from the ocean at the eye of the storm every time it happens. Big Blue says he doesn't know why, but that there's another creature in the ocean, the oldest creature, that Big Blue thinks will be able to give Echo that information if Echo can get the asteroid, which is the name of this creature, to talk to him. So I thought I would just read real quick. I'm sifting through all of my codes and uh, notes that I took as a kid that I brought. <laughs> so many. Um, so I just wanted to maybe read what uh, Big Blue says, because when this happened, it was so intense for me that I was almost late for school writing down the whole conversation that I was having with this character. I felt compelled to save it. Uh, this was, I guess, before the days when we could just look it up online. Um <laughs> But so I really wanted to save this because it felt like such a a monumental moment. It was really, really something special. So what Big Blue says is, he says, You are very brave, little Echo. I have listened to the songs of the storm. I'm sorry about your pod. I will try to help you. We know that these violent storms occur every 500 years. When they occur, all traces of life vanish at the eye of the storm. I do not know why or how this happens. Do not give up, little singer. There is one older and wiser than I. It is called the asteroid. We think it is the oldest life form in the sea. We feel great energy of thought from the asteroid, but it will not sing to us. If you can communicate with it, perhaps it could help you. The asteroid is located in the deep water zone. So there you Uh, go. Ah, okay. So when you finally, so you were told by Big Blue where the asteroid is. So when you see that title card come up for deep water, you're like, yes, I'm almost there. (laughs) So I feel like that's what this was trying to capture was you were on the cusp of perhaps discovering the answer that you've been looking for for but you don't know if you can get it because you don't know if this creature will actually talk to you gotcha and so that kind of also brings up more about echo's powers and that he sometimes has the power to talk to things that other creatures can't talk to like like the asteroid right like the asteroid uh, the asteroid has never spoken I, l- I also love the consistency of the language in the echo games that they've come up with these terms that dolphins call talking singing you know it will not sing to us meaning it will not speak to us i love that yes the asteroid will not talk um until echo gets there it does talk to echo um and there are also i completely neglected to mention my namesake (laughs) (laughs) so keyglyph my name that i go by online is uh taken from the echo the dolphin games it's an object in the echo the dolphin games so there are these crystals in the ocean called glyphs, and when Echo sings at them, sometimes they will kind of ping back a message that will give you a clue about something you need to do. One of the most famous clues being swim slowly past eight arms. And some of them will actually give you a new song if you touch them, so it's almost like the crystal teaches you the kind of magic word you need to get through a passage or to get something to do something that you need to do. Um, So that's another example of something that only Echo can interact with for some reason. Yeah, and that's kind of what makes the game a little bit more fantasy or sci-fi than just a trek through a whole bunch of talking sea life. Right, it's true. It's the the otherworldly part of the game, and as you go through the game, it gets more and more otherworldly. It does, Uh, and things get explained, which I think is very cool. You know, when I was playing this game as a kid, I just thought, sure, Crystals in the ocean that can talk only to me makes perfect sense. <laughs> and then as an adult, as an adult, I was kind of like, well, wait a minute, you know, th- this is obviously a game mechanic, and I can accept that. But you know, I'm kind of curious why these are here. And as you go through the games, and then when you read interviews with Ed Annunziata about what was going to happen in Echo Three, you realize there was actually a reason for everything. There is 
an explanation for these crystals yeah. just floating in the ocean. It's such a huge, deep storyline for a game with a simple dolphin on the cover, you yes. know? So uh, let's talk a little bit about these two composers that worked on the Game Gear version of the game. Saba Gigor was a Hungarian composer and worked for Nova Trade from 1993 to 1995. He's only got a few games to his credit. There was Echo and Echo 2, both on the Game Gear. Garfield caught in the act on the Game Gear and the Adventures of Batman and Robin on the Game Gear. So he, I guess, primarily just made Novo Trade's handheld music. Mm. In 1999, he composed the music and sound effects for one title developed by Hungarian dev house Androsoft called the Rubik's Games, featuring mini games centered around Rubik's Cube games. So that sounds pretty cool. Uh, and then Gabor Fulton, his credits are very similar to Gigor's. He worked on all of Nova Trade's Game Gear ports, and he did work on one Genesis game, Scholastic's The Magic School Bus Space Exploration Game, and that was released in 1995. Um, before we go into the next track, let me talk a little bit about the Asterite, um, since this is where you meet him. Sure. It. The Asterite is my favorite character in the entire series. Um... The asteroid is basically a giant rotating DNA strand that you find in the ocean. It's just two columns of globes that circle around each other. And when you finally get to him and you're thinking, I don't know if this is going to talk to me, and you do sonar to it, and you start getting a message back, you are so excited. And the first thing that the asteroid says to you is, I remember you. Of course, it was you, and it was I who sent you. Now it is clear. What? I have such a vivid memory of seeing just the line, now it is clear, bubbling up on the screen. And I'm mm. like, what? I don't understand. It, the way this mystery hooked me was just so compelling. I, I just was so driven by not knowing the answers and being given these little hints that yeah. there is to have, an answer. To, have, to be a player and a character, to, like I've literally just heard of the asteroid just now. I've gone to see it and it's like, I remember you, and you're like, wait, you yeah. must be thinking of some other dolphin with weird birthmarks on its head, because I know, right? it definitely wasn't me. Uh, and, and of course, as you go through the game, you, you find out why it remembers you, and, right. you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. But so. I think something something very special about these games, which is maybe perhaps hard to convey, is how gripping these very minimalistic pieces of dialogue are. I don't know what that yeah. is, but it really... You know, when you see it on the screen, it's all in capitals. There's very rarely any punctuation. And it's, you know, one sentence at a time or a few sentences at a time. And there's just something about how sparse these messages are that makes the game feel very lonely yeah. and even more mysterious. And I don't know why that is, but that happens to me in a lot of games. If I just get a few pieces of cryptic dialogue... Things just feel very lonely. This is a very solitary experience. Even though you're finding characters that can help you, you are very aware that you're alone the whole time. Yeah, there's there's nobody connecting with you on an emotional level. So, you know, if you play like a JRPG or something like in the Persona series, you're going to see paragraphs and paragraphs, and these characters are going to talk about they're concerned for your well-being or they're concerned about something else, and they want you to... You know, help them out, and they express their gratitude after you've right. completed the challenge. They're emote with different faces and gestures. And right, things. and so the characters in, in the Echo series are just like, "You need to go here," or "I feel bad about this," or you know, and it's they literally the words are picked so carefully to tell you exactly what you need to know, nothing more, nothing less, and then you just kind of move on. So even though you've connected with an NPC, you're not connecting on an emotional level you're just connecting on more of an intellectual or or, or, a, or a game storyline progressing level so I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that feeling of loneliness although There's... i will say i really do feel like i emotionally connect to them but we connect over our loneliness you've just traveled to the arctic True. region to find a big blue whale that you have been told is so old that he's about to die so you're racing to get this answer and when you get there he tells you i'm sorry i don't have the answer and there's something very powerful to me about that, that, you know, this character is just going to tell you, I feel so bad for you. I don't know what you need to do. But here is at least some kind some, of yeah, some thing clues. to go on. Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, I guess it's just not effusively emotional. Everybody's sort of... It doesn't force an emotional connection. Right. Yeah, you kind of have to make your own by, by right. uh, connecting the dots in the story and then and then coming up with it yourself. Yeah, oh, very man, true. you feel it. I felt all these feelings in my stomach while playing this game as a kid. <laughs> 
This is one of the games that made me feel physically ill later. We'll get into that story later. Yeah. All right, so we've got one more track for the Game Gear lined up. Uh, which one are we playing this time, Emily? So we're going to be listening to the title theme from the Game Gear version of Echo. And the reason why I picked this is because this tune shows up in the Genesis version of Echo 1. And I just thought that that was pretty cool. So we can maybe talk a little bit about the overlap in the tracks, this Venn diagram that no one can see that I'm drawing <laughs> in the air. Um, but I think this is a really great uh, arrangement of that tune. So this is a, an arrangement of Island Zone for the Genesis, but it is the title theme from the Game Gear game. All right, this was composed by Saba Gigor and Gabor Fulton. Let's take a listen. Okay, that was the title theme from the Game Gear version of Echo the Dolphin, composed by Xaba Gigor and Gabor Fulton. And this is an arrangement of the Island Zone music from the Genesis version of Echo 1. Now, you're more familiar, Emily, with the uh, Genesis soundtrack than I am. So how, how do these two tracks kind of compare in terms of sound? Like, how is the arrangement done? They're very close, actually. They left almost everything in from the Genesis version into this, hmm. which I think is very... Uh, it speaks to the talent that they have because the Game Gear is working with fewer sound profiles. It's all one sound wave, wave type, right? For every channel? Yeah, it's three square waves. Yeah, so yeah. you have to distinguish them by uh, pitch mostly or octave to make them sound different enough to kind of hear the different parts. So I think that that's very cool. And I like them both. Not much has changed here. So it's not an interpretation really so much as it's just kind of a straight cover. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Now I know... As far as the Genesis goes, so the Genesis has an FM sound chip called the YM2612, and then it also has what's commonly known as the Sega PSG, which is uh, a wavetable chip that kind of helps out the Genesis FM sound chip. Uh, The Game Gear and the Sega Master System itself both have the Sega PSG chip just by itself. So what you're kind of hearing is a song that's written on the PSG chip and the FM chip, kind of converted to work only on that yeah, one being PSG chip. That one yeah, spot. kind of compressed down. And it's cool. I mean it, it it has a very kind of staccato feel. Like I feel like I want to fill in like the empty spots with like little drum fills of my own to kind of fill the song out a little bit. Yeah. I don't know, for a title theme, I would expect something to be a little more heroic sounding or something. Dramatic. You know, this, this this feels very kind of sparse and lonely yeah. for a title theme. and It's an interesting choice, for sure. Yeah, and I guess that does kind of set up the mood of the game, for sure. You know, you think back to, like, the Metroid title theme, and that starts off kind of sparse and lonely, too. Yep. So uh, maybe that's exactly what they were going for with this kind of thing. Um, but I do, I do like it. I think as far as, you know, Game Gear and, and Master System music goes, this does work very well with the harmonization. It does avoid a lot of the kind of off-tune notes that a lot of Sega Master System and Game Gear music tends to suffer from yep. sometimes. So, uh, and and Master System and, 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 the, and the, this PSG chip is kind of known for having like 
uh, a lot of songs that are kind of written in like a minor or kind of a lonely or depressing feeling kind of a, a tone to it. So it works very well for the mood they're trying to convey. That master with Echo. system sadness. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just kind of a trademark of that sound chip. So, or at um, least we've decided that it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's actually official. It's true. Well, I think you guys on the, on the VGM jukebox and me and my co-host Mike from from Pixel Tunes Radio, my other VGM podcast, have both kind of agreed independently that the that the master system and, and Game Gear have kind of a uh, an accidental sadness behind a lot of the tracks, even when they're trying to convey kind of a happiness. So yes. this this kind of works with that whole whole thing. And going I think on. if I'm not wrong, I I do believe that Josh is the one who who coined the phrase and pointed that out. The master. System yeah, I think sadness. so too. I think I remember him saying that. Um, and it's true, and it kind of holds true for a lot of the, uh, the the games with those soundtracks from that particular chip. Uh, so what do you say we move away from some chip tune and go into some actual Red Book audio, maybe some of the stuff that Spencer Nilsson actually originally composed for the series before getting translated down into some FM music? What that would you good. What would you like to play next? Well, I'd like to give you a choice, because okay. I couldn't decide. All right. So... If we want to go creepy, I've got a track lined up for creepy, and it's also a good comparison to a Tides of Time track. It's something that appeared in in Tides of Time and also the Sega CD. Or we can go very sweet. So you want creepy or do you want sweet? Hmm, let's see. We've done a bunch of creepy so far. Let's let's try some sweet for a change. Okay, so what we'll be listening to then is we're going to be listening to Home Bay. Awesome, and this is from the Sega CD version of Echo the Dolphin, composed by Spencer Nelson.
Okay, that was Home Bay from the Sega CD version of Echo the Dolphin, composed by Spencer Nelson. And this is a little more, like you said before we started the song, a little more sweet. I get, like, visions of uh, those commercials I used to see in TV as a kid for, like, New Age music. I was thinking New Age. This is Women walking down music. the beach with, like, a, sh- a sheer, uh, <laughs> you know, scarf flowing behind her, yes. held up in her arm, something like that. This is 100% nature store music. Yes. That's what I call it. Yeah, That's exactly. where I would get these uh, these cassette tapes of this sort of music, not knowing <laughs> that it actually had a genre. It was just, oh, we're at the beach. We're going to go to the, you know, the tourist shopping plaza, and here's a cool arrangement of CDs. I'm going to buy the one that has the seagull on the cover, see what that one's all right. about. And, and this is what you get. You're bound to hear some waves and some some wind in the background. Yeah, which is great that seagulls. you mentioned that, because we heard the dolphins in the beginning yeah, of this track. Exactly. So that's baked into the, the ambiance of the track. That immediately gave me that, that vision in my head. So this plays uh, before the storm happens? I believe so. Sega CD version? I believe so. That it- makes sense being called Home Bay, and being so very calm and so very non-threatening you know this would be a great track to kind of learn the controls of echo the dolphin as you're just kind of swimming around with your pod and uh a whole bunch of jellyfish and some smaller fish in your little coral reef area and uh i do if i remember correctly uh the sega cd version when you do uh jump finally jump out of the water high enough and, and the storm happens the music does change rather abruptly to something a bit more uh, sinister and lonely sounding. So, yep. but uh, but yeah, this is great. It's it's a nice long track. There's a nice kind of blend of the very mild and warm pads with that kind of uh, higher twinkling. So it feels very mystical and magical. I got a really mm-hmm. nice relaxing feel from it. Yeah, it's like the light sort of the sunlight sparkling on the top of the water. <laughs> exactly. Synths of the water and then those little bells. They sound like wind chimes almost. Yeah, they do. They do for sure. And so a lot of the music from the CD version kind of appears in the Genesis version, right? So there's there's some overlap there between the two soundtracks? Yes, a little bit. Yeah, and it's kind of more in maybe theme hooks or light motifs. So when I listened to this and I was comparing the soundtracks, there were traces I thought of the track Medusa Bay and also the title theme from the uh, the first game on the Genesis in here, but it's it is not a straight cover like the Game Gear track we listened to previously was. Okay. It's just little hints of things. Interesting. So I guess that maybe when they took Spencer Nilsson's original Red Book audio tracks that he composed for the game and converted it into FM, they didn't exactly, you know, go note for note like you were saying. They they kind of borrowed elements and made their own kind of fleshed out tracks from them. That's that's pretty cool. Right. And that's part of why for so long I thought that it was the other way around because I thought, oh, okay, Spencer Nielsen is composing these tracks and he's putting little pieces of melodies that existed in the Genesis in here. Oh, how cool. Mm. So it made sense to me that it would flow the other way. But again, it's just, it's really confusing. Yeah, exactly. Because usually when you're, when you're thinking about Sega CD and ports, you're, you're thinking about a game that had come before and then a, a Sega CD game which served as like a remake or a sequel right. or something or, you know, definitely had come afterwards. But it feels like it was either a simultaneous development or... At least on the uh, music side. Yeah, or, or, or the Sega CD version was first and then the Genesis cartridge came second. So, so uh, I've never played the Sega CD version. I know you have it. Oh, yeah, I've played it a little bit. Um, I'm actually really glad that, we, that you invited me to the embassy to do this episode because I had not really listened to the Sega CD OST very thoroughly before. The last time I tried was back in the Napster days when it took an entire afternoon to download a track. And I liked the one or two that I pulled, but I was a little bit disappointed that it wasn't quite like the Genesis version because Mm. that's what I was really into. So I didn't dig into it until this time. And it's really quite beautiful and I can understand why it's sort of hailed as, you know, I think for a lot of people it's the definitive echo soundtrack version yeah i'm a really big fan of spencer nilsson myself i was kind of enamored with the sega cd when it first got released i I kind of like i was a big nintendo boy when i grew up and i had a super nintendo and i had a, a monthly subscription to nintendo power and they had this huge uh like four or five page spread when uh, Nintendo and Philips decided they were going to put out a CD attachment for the mm-hmm. Super Nintendo, and they hyped up CD technology so much and, and talked about how awesome it was. 
And then when the Nintendo CD finally failed and, and never ended up coming out, I was still so hooked and impressed by CD technology and CD-ROM technology that I ended up going out and buying a Genesis just to play Sega CD oh, games. Oh, very interesting. So I got a Model 2 Genesis and a Sega CD kind of like within weeks of each other. And so a lot of those first games that I got were Sonic CD, uh, Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin, the Joe Montana football CD game, all of which had soundtracks from Spencer Nelson. So I kind of so are you grew saying up, that your first experience with the Sega Genesis was with Sega CD games with those red Pretty much. Book I mean, I got wow, that's cool. I got a Genesis and it came packaged with Sonic Two, so I played that for a bit. Yep. And I think I bought like TMNT Tournament Fighters for it a little bit afterwards. Great soundtrack, but I'm sorry. Yeah, it was <laughs> Wrong a, choice. not not a great game. Uh, but we were huge Ninja Turtle fans. But then yeah. after that, we kind of turned our sights to all right, let's you know, use the saved up money that we were going to maybe buy more games with, but end up getting the Sega CD instead. And and I don't know, man, so many people talk about the Sega CD as a failure and has no impressive titles, but I loved that thing, and I still do. I still play Sega CD all the time. And it was music like this that really kind of uh, drew me into those titles. Not that I was not a fan of Genesis music or anything, but hearing real you know, performed music over 16-bit graphics was just kind of like an anachronism in my head, and I found it so intriguing. So a game like uh, Echo the Dolphin CD, if I had had it back then, I think I would have played it a heck of a lot just because that beautiful music just didn't feel like it belonged on these kind of 16-bit graphics, and I, I, I would have enjoyed it for that. I completely agree. It is totally an anachronism, and when I downloaded the... You know, sorry that I'm admitting this. I used Napster back in the day. <laughs> uh, when I downloaded these Sega CD tracks, I didn't. I never had a Sega CD, so I didn't understand that there was going to be Red Book audio on the disc. I thought mm. it was just like, okay, they released just more game or something. Yeah, something. Yeah. I just thought it was going to be an expansion of some kind. Something's going to be a little different. So when I downloaded the track and this came on, I was like, this has to be a cover. This has to be labeled wrong. This can't possibly be the game audio. Yeah. So, uh, and to this day, it's sort of uh, strange to me to think about looking at pixelated, I guess, images and, and associating listening it with to live this audio. music, at yeah. least in that era, because now anything goes in the modern day. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's it's sort of, it's interesting that you, you thought of that kind of, um, the disassociation is being really intriguing and I was more kind of confused and maybe slightly unsettled by it at the time. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So we had kind of an opposite reaction to it. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. funny. So is there anything else you'd like to talk about, Echo, before we move on to The Tides of Time, which is the sequel? Sure. I'll, I'll bring us up to speed a little bit more with the plot as we go. So when we last left off, the asteroids started talking to Echo. And what the asteroid says to Echo is that he can help us, but that we're going to need special powers to be able to save our family and that he needs us to do a favor first because he's going to bestow powers on us that he cannot at this point because he's not at full strength um you'll notice when you do meet him for the first time that he's missing a globe in his chain so he says you have to go back and retrieve the globe by going into the past so suddenly time travel gets thrown into the Hooray! mix which is so awesome so you go to the lost city of Atlantis. I love the concept of there being a time machine in, in Atlantis. I, for some reason, I never would have put those two things together. That's <laughs> sort of like the the trope of pairing Egyptian um, architecture with like really advanced technology. Yeah, yeah. I like that. It's cool. Very ancient, but very modern. So the asteroid gives you a song to sing to the time machine because, of course, you sing to the time machine to get it to, of course. to transport you through time. There are reasons for all these things. Um, and you go back to the Jurassic period, and the asteroid says you have to retrieve his lost globe from that time period. So what winds up happening is you actually wind up fighting the prehistoric asteroid and stealing his globe so that you can take it back to the present to make him complete again. So what I want to mention about this is this, I think, was my first encounter with a stable time loop in a story. Everything else I'd seen up until this point in cartoons and in comic books and, and things like that ascribed to the idea that when you go back in time and you change something, then everything going forward is changed by what you altered. And with Echo, they're kind of going by the, if you've seen 12 Monkeys, they're going by that philosophy of everything that you go back and, cha and change has already been done. Therefore, you can't actually change anything, but you still have to go back and make the original change. Right, right. But basically, 
the asteroid doesn't have the globe in the current time period because you in the past stole it from him. And now you're going to bring it back. So you do that. You bring the asteroid up to full power. And he gives you a new song to sing to the time machine, which is going to send you back in time to five minutes before the storm hit. This is really intense when you're a kid. You're like, oh my god, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to get pulled up in the storm this yeah. time. The asteroid says you're going to get pulled up with your family. You're going to go with them. And you're going to have to destroy this alien race that is causing these storms. Which I neglected to explain. I forget exactly when you find out about the vortex in the story. I think when you're going through the Lost City of Atlantis that you come across a lot of glyphs that explain the backstory of the vortex. The vortex are an alien race that live on a distant planet. They have lost the ability to create their own food, so every 500 years they cause a storm on Earth that pulls all the life out of the ocean so that they can feed, basically. The Atlanteans have left these messages for you in the glyphs, and that's, a, that's the point where they reveal that they actually built the glyphs for you, so that's why you can communicate with them. And they also mention that the city of Atlantis was destroyed by the vortex. Um, they retaliated against them and sunk the city. Um, so that's kind of when you learn about this alien race and, uh, and then you get to the time machine and you do what the asteroid wanted you to do. So coming back to five minutes before the storm where the asteroid has sent you back, now knowing all of this, knowing that you're gonna be taken in the storm, that you're gonna be confronting this horrific alien race, you jump into the sky and then you are taken with your family to the Vortex home planet. And this is when the game goes totally off the rails yeah. into nightmare fuel territory. <laughs> it is so frightening. It is so um, H.R. Geiger inspired. Uh, the designs of the aliens, everything's in a different color palette. Things don't make sense. Yeah, it looks like a Geiger painting. Uh, the aliens, the Vortex themselves, look like they were they're like from the movie Alien. Yep. Uh, it's very, very frightening and, and such, like you said, a juxtaposition from the cool blues and, you know, uh, warm coral fauna and flora that, that are all over the ocean floor. Uh, you're in this uh, mechanical yep. giant, I mean, it's called the machine. Yes. So I don't know, it's filled with water, which is interesting. Convenient. <laughs> yeah. Um, they are water-faring species. But it does it does really feel like you are, you know, all of a sudden Ellen Ripley and you're <laughs> navigating your way through, uh, you know, a, a, a giant technological building to, to fight off these aliens. Yes. Hanging out in the, you know, the warm coastal waters of Earth to suddenly seeing where this game goes is really terrifying. And I did this by accident. At some point when I was a kid, I was frustrated that I couldn't get past a certain zone. I was probably in island zone or something. I remember that the tune was nice, you know, I'm trying to do what I need to do, but I can't get past some rocks or something. So I decided to go to the password screen to just see if I could just put in something random that would actually take me somewhere. And I don't know why, but I got the idea to just put in a full set of one letter. So I just tried A, 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 nothing. B, 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 nothing. And kept doing this, thinking, well, you know, this is stupid, Emily. How would this possibly work? There's not going to be a password that is all one letter. <laughs> but there is. All ends brings you to the machine. Oh, man. So I randomly went from Island Zone to the machine, and I cannot tell you how bothered I was by this. I'll try to tell you how bothered I was by it. <laughs> I was so bothered by it because what you get, what happens is you get dumped into this, uh, this seascape quote unquote, that Ed is describing, that looks totally alien. It's an auto-scrolling level, those are always terrifying. And these aliens are coming out at you that you've never seen before, and suddenly your sonar is is destroying them because the asteroid has given you these powers at this point. He has made you super powerful. And um, but I didn't know that, so I'm sonaring these aliens and first their bodies fall off and then their heads explode. I did not know what to do with this. I didn't know how to process what I was seeing. I actually thought for a split second that maybe, like, this wasn't supposed to be in the game. Like you kind of glitched it out? Yeah, yeah, that I'd glitched it or I'd found some level that wasn't actually in the game but still existed in, in the code somewhere. I was so terrified by this and by the Vortex Queen who's after this level. So I got through this level and I got up to her and I was so bothered by it that I actually took the cartridge and I hid it in a drawer of my bureau under my clothes for at least a month. Wow. Because I felt like I couldn't even look at the cartridge. It's like it opened up Pandora's box, you know, oh like here's gosh. this innocuous 
cartridge, but it's hiding all of these nightmares. Exactly. In them. And yeah. I really felt ill. I felt ill, and I couldn't look at it because if I looked at it, not only did I feel disturbed by what I had seen, but I felt disturbed that a story that I loved so much went to such a dark place, and I hadn't quite reconciled those two pieces yet. And then Very later I went back and, and did, but at the time it was really, uh, really something. Yeah, and, and, and the queen herself is, is like this giant alien face yep. uh, and just kind of attacking you relentlessly. And not only that, but I mean, you must have had some sort of reaction for Echo now just becoming this kind of death machine mm-hmm. too, just destroying these creatures. Yep much more easily than than before at least before you know you can you can kind of ram into somebody but then you can kind of take their life force and absorb them with the stars right you know but with this it's it's, it's a little bit more violent and a little more terrifying so yeah, bodies yeah. falling off and then you know floating heads following you until they explode definitely and then you know as you're <clears throat> as you're fighting the vortex queen you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do here with this giant alien head the way that you fight the boss is incredibly violent. You have to knock out her eyes, yep. then you have to knock off her jaw three or five times, and then just basically ram into her. Yeah, traumatizing. It's crazy. Traumatizing. Absolutely crazy. So, uh, so after you beat the queen, mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil too much of the ending sequence, but you do end up, you know, returning to Earth, and everything is super happy, and that that kind of leads us directly into the Echo Tides of Time story, which yes. is the game. Uh, series of games, so we're looking at another Genesis, Game Gear, and Sega CD trio of games that came out after the original Echo the Dolphin. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Echo the Tides of Time now, and we're going to play some music from that as well. Now this particular title was composed by Attila Dobos, Andras Maghiari, and Andy Armour. They are the ones that worked on the Genesis version of the soundtrack. And uh, this one was released on August 25th, 1994, again developed by Novotrade, and published by Sega. So what is our first track that you want to play from this one and why'd you pick it? I really wanted to play Crystal Springs from this game because we've been hearing ambient. You picked a sweet tune, so we kind of balanced off the creep. Mm. So I wanted to bring in some groove because I want to show that- I am all about the groove. Yes, that's right, that these games do have some, especially Tides of Time, possibly only Tides of Time actually, has some real rock tracks. And I think that Crystal Springs is a great example of a a new take on the soundscape. Excellent. So let's give it a listen. Alright, you're listening to Crystal Springs from Echo, The Tides of Time. This was the Genesis version, composed by Attila Dobos, Andras Magyari, and Andy Armour. And man, this is this is starting to sound more like traditional video game music now, and not like specific Echo music yep. anymore. This has a great groove, it's kind of a like a like a rock track with some very cool groove elements to it. This suits my style and VGM music much more. Not to say that the stuff I've listened to already has not been good, 
but when I think of like really cool Genesis music that's usually in my rotation in my like car stereo, this is the kind of stuff that I play. Yep, that bass. That bass. That bass. That bass groove is really cool. So is that that's one of the reasons that you pick this track to kind of demonstrate how different it is from a lot of the other Echo stuff? Yes, and there are some other rock tracks as well on Tides of Time. Um, and there's a lot more, I would say, you know, tradi- like you're saying, more traditional music, not as ambient. Mm. So if you guys are into that, if you like this, maybe check this one out. This might be the one that appeals. Very cool. So a little bit about the composers before we get into kind of the meat and potatoes of, of the Echo Tides of Time storyline. Uh, Attila Dobos, who is not to be confused with the like classic folk singer-songwriter of the same name that was popular in Hungary at the time. So if you search for like IMDB or just you know do a Google search for Attila Dobos, you'll get uh, a combination of the 60s singer-songwriter and the video game composer, like all compiled into one long career. It's, oh, it's wow. kind of funny. Um, but they're actually two separate people. Our Attila started at Novo Trade in 1993 with Peter Pan, a story painting adventure for DOS. And after that, he did Museum Madness for computers and the DOS port of the Fantastic Adventures of Dizzy, also uh, for Codemasters. One standout for me is the Star Trek Deep Space Nine soundtrack. I remember playing that. Uh, We did an episode of Pixel Tunes Radio. It's number 75 with uh, Robin Purnell from Rhythm and Pixels. And uh, the Deep Space Nine soundtrack on the Genesis is really cool, and it sounds a lot like this. It's very kind of like high-energy, techno-rock kind of stuff. So uh, I'm assuming... Dobos probably had something to do with this track. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andres Magyari, very similar to Dobos's career. They worked on a lot of the same titles together. Uh, he also worked on Deep Space Nine and uh, Contra Legacy of War with him. And then Andy Armour, basically the same stuff. So these, these trio of guys kind of worked together on a lot of the Novo Trade Genesis projects and some of the DOS projects. And uh, a couple of extra games like NCAA Football and NBA Action 95 starring David Robinson. So uh, I, I think these guys work very well together. I think they've got a good combination of, like you were talking about, rock and then a little bit of the ambient stuff. And I think. Yeah, you get those. Here we get the. Yeah. We still got those in the there. The same FM sweeps in there <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, it's a very echo sound at this point, so I think it's kind of recognized for having those long FM sweeps. Yep. And uh, I don't know, I think the rock stuff, even though it sounds like it wouldn't work very well when you're actually watching or playing the game with this music in the background, it, it does fit. It gives the game a little bit of a different feel. It does. But then you're like, well, Echo's been through this journey again and again, and maybe he's got a little more confidence this time, and maybe he's he's a little more sure of himself that he's going to be able to take on you know whatever foes he's going to be taking on. So I think that that's right on you know, the nose. He's got this this kind of music playing in his head while he's swimming and jumping out of the water and stuff. I think that's right on the nose because right at the, the end of nose. the right, I wasn't going to say it, but you couldn't just leave it. Yes, it's right on the bottle nose because at the end of the first game, Echo is recognized as a hero to the entire ocean. So he begins the second game as he's achieved legendary status as as a warrior and a hero of his kind. So I think when he's going into the events of the second game, like you're saying, he feels like this is something he could potentially do. Yeah. yeah. So so how does the, the second game start off? The second game... <laughs> the, so my problem here at the embassy is that the more I like something, the less coherent I get. It's almost, uh, you know, proportional. So you just want to like dump all your feelings into the microphone. I do, words. and I can't, you know, I can't form complete sentences and things like that. So, sorry, listeners. I hope it's still worth listening to. The beginning of Echo Two begins with an opening cinematic that really I thought was very powerful, especially having come off of the first game you find out that the Vortex Queen was not destroyed by Echo. She was merely weakened. Oh, no. And that she followed you when you escaped back That's to not Earth. Cool. So it's almost kind of like Alien, the movie. Maybe. I've never yeah, seen it. Yeah, like them. one of the Alien movies, you actually, the Alien comes Follows. to Earth. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. Another parallel. Obviously very inspired directly by yeah. those movies. So you see this mostly in text you know it's just an explanation of she wasn't destroyed she was weakened and she followed you to earth and then what you see is you see this nighttime seascape scene of just open ocean and in the distance this little meteor uh, meteorite falling and then hitting the ocean and you know that's her Hmm. and coming off of the terror of the first game 
when you realize she's here, she's in the ocean, and now she can just feed directly off the planet, how do we even confront this? How do we stop this? It's really terrifying to think she's here yeah. and we don't know where she is. Yeah. So as far as the Emily timeline goes, never mind the Echo timeline, how long of a period of time was it between when you played Echo and, and Tides of Time? That's a really good question. I don't actually know. I know that I rented Tides of Time before I bought it. Okay. But I don't remember how close off of the end of the first game I played this. And I'm not sure if I'd beaten the first game before I started playing this, although I knew the story. So as terrified as you were when you rented the game, you obviously were able to get over it enough to go out and, and buy it <laughs> and re-experience it Oh, yeah, it no, the, for the Echo game, if we're talking about Echo 1, I did actually own it when I got terrified. But with Echo 2, yeah, so yes, I was not terrified enough to not play the sequel. <laughs> yes. So for some reason I decided, you know what? I'll give this one a do it. Because something about it got in me. Even though it terrified me, I loved it. I yeah. loved it so much. And I want it's that feeling of, and I think a lot of people who watch horror movies experience this, it's that feeling of needing to know, even when it's horrible. You know, you yeah. want you want to look away, but you have to see what has happened. And and speaking from like a like a protagonist standpoint, I I would say, you know, even even if the beginning of Echo 2 terrified me and here's the queen and, and oh my god this is this is terrible now you almost feel kind of like obligated to finish the game you know because here's this awful stuff and i need to help echo accomplish this goal yes. and eradicate the vortex once and for all it's You're not going to be invested. like uh you know if i if i just return the game back to blockbuster or whatever and not play it ever again then she wins yes. so yeah you're you're invested at that point you're very invested locked into it i will say also the second game is easier i think there are difficulty settings and it will adjust dynamically if you're doing really poorly to be easier. So, hmm. and also it starts off really dark, but then it gets really beautiful and bright very quickly. And I think that also helped that it didn't just feel like a game of despair and not knowing you're actually kind of given the solution and then you just have to make that solution happen, if that makes any sense. Cool. It'll make more sense if I explain the story. <laughs> should I do that over this track or should we wait? Let's uh, let's wait. Let's get into the next track and then All we'll right. talk a little bit about the story of the game and how it differs in gameplay from the original Echo. So what Sounds do we got good. coming up next? So we're going really creepy. We're taking a sharp right turn into super creepy. This is Inside. That's just the title. All Inside. right. This one's composed by Attila Dobos, Andras Maggiari, and Andy Armour. Let's take a listen. Oh man, I got chills up my spine. That was the song Inside from Echo, The Tides of Time, composed by Attila Dobos, Andras Maggiari, and Andy Armour. And, uh, oof, this kind of uh, really takes advantage of things that an FM sound chip can do that yes. like a wavetable or a PSG can't. Absolutely. You've got those wow, wow, like very vibrato, extended notes, uh, two different, like, uh, dissonant notes in each ear 
and just that little pitter patter drum. Oh man, it, it just it feels like like if uh, this was the kind of song like a, that would take place at the beginning of a game where the protagonist is kind of completely ignorant and just going about his life. And there's this creeping evil coming up through the forest to attack him or something like this. That's the kind of feeling I get from this song. Yeah, this is like what you expected the beginning of Metroid 2 Return of Samus to be like. Oh, for sure, yeah. You you step on SR388, this is what you're going to hear. No, (laughs) you're going to hear that awesome other tune. But this is, yes, exactly. I can see this as the starting the unknown, which brings us back into the plot. So what's going on in Echo the Tides of Time is that... A dolphin of the future comes back to the current time and tells you that the Vortex Queen is on Earth and that somehow Echo's time traveling has split the time stream in two. So now there are two possible futures. The future where Trellia, this future dolphin, comes from, which is a utopia, and the Vortex future, where the Vortex have destroyed the planet. And you wind up going to both. So... The Oasis future, the utopian future, is really awesome. It's so beautiful. And this is what I was talking about when I was saying that it it gets really bright very early. I think it's the third or fourth level when you go into this future. And you see telepathic flying dolphins. The ocean has become sentient and it's connected by tubes of water. It's really quite beautiful. The Vortex future is... They, they do this wonderful thing with echo design where it's almost hard for me to explain what it is because it's so weird. It's gravity shifts all the time. There is no water in this future. There are alien creatures that stalk you and come after you that look like nothing you've seen before. Hmm. Um, no, there is some water, but there are these vast openings of just empty air that you kind of just go flying through and everything looks very technological so it looks very much like the machine level from the first game in a sense so no plants no life except these aliens that are relentlessly attacking you so when you start tides of time you are told almost immediately that the asteroid has been killed and you lose the powers that he gave you in the first game which is so upsetting especially for you know baby key (laughs) <laughs> His favorite character was the asteroid. I felt sick when a dolphin told me we have felt the death of the asteroid, and now we, we hear songs of fear from the north. I was like, I put the controller down and had to walk away for a few minutes because yeah. I was just so upset about it. And I was telling you earlier that I thought in my little kid brain, I thought maybe if I didn't talk to those dolphins, he wouldn't die. <laughs> you know, that somehow <laughs> I could change the course of the game by not having that conversation. But no, he has been killed. And he's been killed by the Vortex Queen who is on Earth, as we know. That's her first act when she lands on the planet. Makes sense. Is to Go blow him up. Yeah. Yes, in revenge. So uh, when this future dolphin, Trellia, comes and gets you, she brings you to the future asteroid, and he says, it's so great to see you, my old friend, blah, blah, blah. He explains the situation, he says, and so I have to ask you to destroy the Vortex Queen, I have to ask you to save my life. And so he instructs you to go back to your current time and rebuild him so that he can give you the powers you need to be able to destroy the Vortex kind. The last pair of globes that you need has actually been hidden in the Vortex bad future. That's why you have to go there. That's where the Vortex Queen put them because she thought you couldn't get them there. It's a little, the time travel thing falls apart a little bit, which I wasn't necessarily going to get into. Yeah, it seems like the the Vortex has this kind of interdimensional travel uh, ability that they use once in a while. She does, the asteroid can do it too, and everyone's using the time machine in Atlantis. So it's kind of, it's, it's, I've tried to plot it out and make it make sense because like we said in the first game, it's all stable time loop, but in the second game, they're kind of doing the, you change something. So now there's another trajectory that we can end up in. So anyway, this tune plays in the bad future. (laughs) So (laughs) that's the answer you were looking for 20 minutes later. Well, that explains what the bad future is. And it definitely makes sense that it would be this kind of uh, desolate, soundscape uh in this bad future there's literally no hope and so uh this this music kind of fits there there's no semblance or inkling of any sort of heroism in this song whatsoever it just kind of makes you the opposite of like the home bay track from the sega cd version this song just makes you want to look at the ground and 
cry <laughs> about everything. Yes. And it's very mechanical, too. And something that I think is interesting that was pointed out, I think, on the TV Tropes page for Echo the Dolphin, I think that's where I, I first saw this written out, they pointed out that Echo is one of the few series where, in the utopian ending, nature and technology have combined into something wonderful, as opposed to eradicating technology to kind of restore the balance of the world. Mm, so in the good future, technology and biological creatures are all working together. In the bad future, it's just hard technology. Gotcha. And aliens. Interesting. Yeah. But I like that they reflect that in the music as well. Interesting. So uh, let's move into our next track, which is from the Game Gear version of Echo Tides of Time. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the continuing saga of the story of Tides of Time. This is a track called Atlantis, and it's composed by Zaba Gabor, Gabor Fultan, and newcomer Laszlo Fazekas. Let's take a listen. That was Atlantis from the Game Gear port of Echo, Tides of Time, composed by Saba Gigor, Gabor Fultan, and Laszlo Fazekas. I have mixed feelings about this track. Oh, really? Yeah. Please, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's just, as a Game Gear track, it's not bad, but I feel like it, it doesn't take you on a journey like a lot of the other Echo tracks do. Uh, it's got a nice melody to it, but I didn't get a lot of emotional response from it. What, did, did, did you have a different opinion on oh, it? Oh, we could not be any more different. <laughs> <laughs> I love this tune so much, and I really, I do feel the emotion, and particularly when it goes back into the loop, and it kind of, there's this chord change back to the beginning that to me feels, I don't even know if I can describe it, it's not sad. But it's uh, this is the this tune kind of conveys to me. It's like the wistful, I'd, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but in a bad way. Mm. Like I have a destiny. I can't escape this destiny, and I know I can make something positive out of this. But there's going to be a lot of loss along the way. I might possibly be lost along the way. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but that's really interesting that you weren't into this one when this one is one of my favorites. It blew me away when I first found it. Interesting. Mm. Very interesting. I, I, I get what you're what you're saying, you know. Now that I'm listening to it a little bit more, perhaps it's it's maybe just that whole Game Gear itis, you know, thing yeah, going on. Yeah, interesting to think about this being on a different system. Yeah, what it might sound like exactly more boise. Yeah, as, as far as the Game Gear ports go, I mean, do they pretty much, to your knowledge, follow the the the, the plots of the? They do. I think it's condensed. Okay. So they cut it down by a bunch of levels, but I don't believe there are any major deviations. I've only played the first Game Gear game for maybe five minutes. Okay. So uh, the newcomer, Laszlo Fazekas, at least newcomer to the podcast, was another Novo Trade composer that worked primarily on the Game Gear games. Uh, he did a few Genesis titles, like the Magic School Bus game that we talked about earlier, and Echo Jr. Uh, he also worked on Garfield Caught in the Act and The Adventures of Batman and Robin on the Game Gear, and a couple of other ones, too. So, again, you know, a lot of these Novo Trade guys really just kind of worked as teams together, either composing together or composing individual tracks and then all contributing them to the same game. So, uh, you know, outside of that, he didn't really work on games that much, so I'm, I'm not sure where he ended up after that, but uh, he's got uh, some more credits coming up in Echo Jr., so we'll, we'll be able to hear some more music from him as we go through the show as well. So, what else do we want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we want to continue with the plot. You know, it's funny, before we started on this segment, I was saying to Ed, 
everything I'm talking about is just plot. I'm just summarizing the story. Is this even interesting? And it was sort of, uh, it was kind of cool to think about the fact that there is so much story in these games that I've had to explain it over three or four tracks. Yeah, for sure. As opposed sure. to just once, like, okay, you're two guys in a jungle, running and gunning. Right. Aliens, done. Exactly. So, uh, um, but yeah, I'm sorry if this is not totally interesting, listeners, but we're almost through. I'm enthralled, and, and I'm really enjoying hearing about your uh, personal experiences and how you're emotionally reacting to these plot points mm. as well. Mm. So, Well, I think at least I know that the, <clears throat> the super fans of the games definitely feel those points. So I don't know if you can feel them. What's the word I'm looking for? Like secondhand gaming. Vicariously? Yeah, vi- I don't know if you can quite feel it through me because I did have the experience of hyping up my husband and saying the Vortex Queen is so scary. She scared me so much as a kid. Traumatized, told him the whole story, and then I was playing through the game to show him. When we got there, he was like, <laughs> what he said was, yeah, I can see that being scary when you're like eight. And I was like, my palms are sweaty right now, okay? <laughs> Don't you give me that. That's funny. Yeah, so now that's a, that's a joke in our household when, when one of us is saying something about like, yeah, this is this kind of whatever. The other one's like, well, I guess if you're like a baby still wearing diapers, it's scary, but she's scary, yeah. whatever. Listeners, go look up what the Vortex Queen looks yeah, like. Yeah, or the go play the, the games. Game. Yes. Absolutely go play the games because I think the, the whole reason we're doing this show is to get you guys to realize, and maybe you did have the same misconception that I did about Echo when I first learned about it, and that it's a much deeper, much more challenging, and much more rewarding experience than just making a dolphin swim through some water and get from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. Right. So, uh, so a little bit more about this plot. How, how does the tides of time end up working out at the end. Yeah, let me let me uh, get through this one. So what winds up happening is you do rebuild the asteroid as he asked you to do, and he gives you the powers to go fight the Vortex Queen again, now on your home turf. So you do this, and what happens at the end of the game is really confusing. It ends on a super cliffhanger, but you don't... Back in the day, I guess I didn't realize that it was a cliffhanger. I thought it was supposed to close up the story of the first game i wasn't thinking that it was going to be a trilogy okay because it never became a trilogy so what happens at the end of the second game is that the vortex queen uses the time machine to escape to prehistoric times and the asteroid says please destroy the time machine so that it cannot be used again and instead of using the time machine instead of destroying the time machine rather echo uses it and disappears and that's the end of the game. Oh, so you never know where he goes when no. he enters so, the time machine. So what you actually see is more text describing what's happened. And this is what you see. You see. The queen retreats within her machine. When Echo leaves, she escapes in the form of a vortex larva. The queen makes her way to the sunken city of Atlantis. She finds the time machine and escapes into Earth's past. When the queen arrives in the prehistoric era, she encounters creatures that she cannot rule. She has no choice but to live within the life cycles of Earth. And through the eons, the Vortex kind integrate with the life on Earth. Echo finds the time machine in the City of Forever. Instead of destroying it, he uses it and disappears into the tides of time. And that's the end of the game. Interesting. And again, I felt sick because I felt like he was lost forever. I mean, I loved the ending because I thought it was so... It was so sad and interesting, but in a beautiful way. Like, the feelings I was feeling were beautiful, but very sorrowful. Because I thought he just... I thought he got lost. Like, he could not get back. Yeah, yeah. Somehow. But what's really happening, there are two things about this ending that are really interesting. This thing about the queen integrating into life on Earth. So she basically breeds into life on Earth. And this is the in-game explanation for why we have crustaceans, because that's what came from the Vortex kind, because they all have the exoskeletons and stuff. So they, they create this idea that insects and crabs and things like that came from her, which also... Fridge Brilliance explains why crabs are constantly attacking you in the game because they have like an instinctual hate for you. That makes sense. Because they come from her. Okay, so next time I go to a seafood restaurant and order my favorite king crab legs, yes. I'm doing the world a favor. You are. Awesome. Yes. Well, you know, I feel like we can't blame that crab, but. And I also don't know if the crab would hate you. Remind me that I want to talk about humans. Oh, we'll talk about humans later, actually. So put that aside okay um but the other thing is with echo finding the time machine and destroying it and disappearing there was supposed to be a third game ed annunziata had planned for a third game and uh there is actually a tweet out there saved for posterity 
where he said that Echo 3 was going to be about the Atlanteans' war with the Vortex. At the end of the Tides of Time, Echo goes back to help. Okay. So that's where he disappeared to. Echo disappeared to ancient Atlantis before the Vortex had destroyed it. And this finally brings everything full circle because that explains everything. That explains why the time machine has to be sung to because Echo probably built it. Right. It explains why the crystals have information he needs because he's supplied the information. Right. So why they can communicate with only him because it's attuned to him. I can imagine some fetch quests where you have to get different parts for the time machine to put it together and maybe learning more about Echo's origin story and, and his birthmark and why he right. has these powers that he does. Yep. It's sad that the... What's probably would be the most important and pivotal mm. game to the storyline is the is the one that never got made. Right, because so. it would hitch everything together. And you're right, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that would make sense if Echo went back and said, we have to build the time machine. And they built it. That's why the Vortex tried to destroy the city, because they knew that that was the origin of all their problems, was that Echo could go back and... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Mine explodes. <laughs> Ocean explosions. Ocean explosions. So, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's that's enough of the plot of the uh, the original games. But I hope I hope that in my rambling incoherence, I have somehow imparted how cool this is for a 16-bit game of that time to have that kind of story when it wasn't an RPG, like you mentioned before. That's crazy, that and there's is. no way to know that when you're getting into it. So it's a trip. Absolutely crazy, and so. Uh, Ed and Unziata, what happened was he ended up losing the rights to Echo, I guess. Sega basically bought them out, or... I'm not sure how it wound up that way, but Sega owned the rights to Echo, yes. And he was, I believe, trying to negotiate getting them back. And I think they've settled at this point. Okay. But I don't know what That's that cool. means for the series. Yeah. But it opens up the potential that something could be happening, which I'm very excited about. Um, Ed and Unziata did try to make... Without the rights to Echo, he did try to make this spiritual successor game called Big Blue that was kickstarted several years ago and actually did not reach its funding level. So that was not going to be a continuation of the Echo plot, but it was going to be a continuation of that sort of experience. It was basically like the best you could get without owning the rights to your own creation. Can you yeah. even imagine that? Like. It's locked away and you can't get at it because the company holds it. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's been done a lot in the video game industry lately to success sometimes and not to success at other times. Games like Ukulele and things were made by people that had originally worked on games like Banjo-Kazooie and just did not have the rights to, to remake those games. So they try to make them the best way they can. And, you know, sometimes it works out. But in, in the case of, uh, Big Blue, I think maybe it was because the Kickstarter patrons just really really wanted echo and yeah, we did. you know we're maybe concerned that if this game did get made that that would that completely we would destroy it. any any promise of getting an echo 3 so i mean hopefully maybe the kickstarter failing was for a good reason and maybe echo 3 will come out sometime in the future that would be incredible if that came out and it were in genesis style or even on the genesis somehow i have no words <laughs> My life would be complete. Yes. I would come full circle. Finally. <laughs> you know, everything in my life would connect. And Emily's actually, exploded brain would kind of reconstitute itself. Yeah, exactly. And I would become this Back one to a whole, whole skull again. This one whole never ending circle. Um, there is one thing I want to mention, actually, while we're talking about that, just real quick, is um, my love for the Echo games is extreme. And sometimes I can't tell if the game was made in a way that I was going to love or if the game influenced me into loving certain things. Because I love space, I love the ocean, I love time travel and stories, I love these cryptic plots and, and narratives that unfold like onions, and I don't know if this is what caused it all. Sometimes I think, like, am I Echo with traveling through time, going back and I don't know. That's funny. I mean, I love all those things too, but it definitely was not because of Echo. Right. It was mostly because of Doctor Who, but, but both involve time travel. Mm-hmm. So we have that going for us. Yep. <laughs> But so it's anyways, interesting to think, how you know, were, were you just the sort of person who would love that kind of story and media? Or right. was it Doctor Who that kind of, like, turned you on yeah, to Yeah, you know, I, th- I think maybe you have these predilections kind of built into you already based on how you were raised. And then you kind of find that one, once you find that one thing that kind of, like, is the key to in. fit into your keyhole, yeah. then that's what you kind of glom onto and, and kind of gels that whole predilection mm-hmm. for you. So you had your your Echo, and I had my time-traveling police box, which is pretty cool. So, uh, and, you know, both have blue, big blue 
yep. TARDIS. So <laughs> the color blue. The is parallels involved, are getting you know? even better here. Uh, <laughs> so let's move on to our next track. This is from the Sega CD version of Echo the Tides of Time, composed by Spencer Nilsson. This track is called Need to Find the Title. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. So, uh, feel free to leave this in if you wish, my good friend Ed. But yes, um, we will we will find the title at some point in the future. Okay. Not at this moment. We have to time travel to the future, clearly, to find it. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. All right, that was Heart of the Giant, otherwise known as the Epilogue. And yes, we did finally find the name of this track. This was from the Sega CD port of Echo, the Tides of Time, composed by Spencer Nilsson. Your thoughts on this one, Emily? So good. Yeah. I had this one from the Napster days, and I loved it. Okay, so this is very nostalgic for you. It is, yeah. It sounds like it could have been made by Undersea Life. You know, yeah. I don't, aside from what may be kind of like a saxophone maybe in the background somewhere, I feel like most of these instruments are very otherworldly, and there's just such a National Geographic, <laughs> just one of those kind of sweeping cameras that go over a coral reef or something. It, it captures that feel for me so accurately. Mm-hmm. And I like how the different voices, I feel like almost nothing starts on an attack that's close to you. It sort of feels like everything's kind of like traveling across the distances under the water to you. Yes, And absolutely. more more dolphin and porpoise noises. Yeah, a lot of sea life noises as well, which I think definitely bring this more to life. So I guess this, this is from the epilogue, so it would be towards like the end sequence yep. of the game. So this would be more like, I don't know, credits or... There are a couple of scenes after you finish the final battle where you actually travel back to the asteroid he tells you you have to destroy the machine you escape with other animals there's an entire scene that's just a bunch of whales and dolphins just swimming to freedom and you just kind of swim with them okay so this so sounds this is like probably it would definitely all that and then sure. some text comes in so considering it says heart of the giant you know perhaps that's referencing the whales could be who knows could be could be referencing the asteroid could be referencing the vortex queen or all of the above or all of the above <laughs> 
Excellent. So that pretty much concludes the segment on the, I guess, the the Do unfinished trilogy. Yeah, what a dupe on dupe on for it duplex duplicity, duplicity. something. Some word that means two Duplicity. of Echo games, uh, which, which is cool. I mean, it's nice that there is uh, a Genesis, a Game Gear, and a Sega CD version of each because you get to experience the soundtracks to these stories in three different ways and, and, and really kind of experience how they converge and how they diverge. In, yeah, in, it is in really interesting. Extreme that, ways. It's really interesting that they didn't just decide... You know, sometimes when you have a series like this, the main games or the primary games of the games that came out first will have one soundtrack, then the the ports will have something completely different. Yeah. Or it's totally the same. And this is a mix. You know, I feel like so many of the other versions of each title have some tracks from the primary source, but then they add some of their own. So they didn't go one way or the other. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And, and so many other series... Like uh, like Wanderers from the East three come to mind where it's been ported to like nine different systems, but you you essentially get the same soundtrack every single time, mm-hmm. just on a different sound chip or on Red Book Audio. Right, exactly. And with this, they were able to really mix and match and say, well, this song might not work so well on Red Book, or this song might not work so well on FM. So let's create new music to fit within those plots and points of the storyline to to make sure that it's all a cohesive package. It's true. Mm. I wonder why they did this, and I, it also makes me wonder what the culture was like within the companies towards Echo, mm. because it makes it seem like if so many different people are involved and they're taking from some but inventing some of their own original material too, it seems like internally it was a huge deal. Well, and it did actually sell very well, but yeah. I don't think it almost makes me feel like the inner culture of Echo was so huge and they really believed in the series and that maybe it just didn't quite translate exactly that way. Yeah, well, it's an interesting point you make up because Ed and Unziata had some difficulty getting this game yes, made. True. Uh, originally, he worked on, I think it was the Spider-Man game on the Genesis and a couple of other titles. and But he had always had this vision for Echo and he was trying to convince the Sega executives to get this game made and they kept saying no 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 and then he had some success with these couple of you know first genesis titles that he made and they finally gave him a chance yeah. which just shows how much of a passion he had for this yes so it's very possible that his passion you know he was able to sell this concept to everybody that was working on the game and especially the composers and so they kind of he was able to convey the kind of feelings that he wanted to them so well that they were able to create individual pieces of music per version of each game, which I think is really cool. So I'm glad that he got to uh, see two-thirds of his dream come to fruition. Yeah, yeah, You know, if not the whole part, but uh, still some of that remains to be seen. And if an Echo 3 ever comes out, you better be sure there will be a... VG Embassy dedicated. Yes, you better be sure I'm first in line for that game. Absolutely. We will be there on launch day. Yes. uh, Talking about the soundtrack to Echo Yeah, we'll be in the line the night before, (laughs) you know, at like 11 p.m. Live casting. All right, we're still sitting in our lawn chairs. We're still waiting. We just saw somebody with we'll a have our, right tattoo. We'll our, have our game machine in the car with like hooked up to a car battery. Yeah, exactly. We'll just be playing it all the way home. Anyhow, we have a special guest coming up. We do. Next. Very exciting. Yes. So next track is actually from the Sega Genesis version of Echo Jr. And this came out on August 15th, 1995, developed by Appaloosa Interactive. So this is after they stopped calling themselves Novo Trade, And it was published by Sega. This is a game that was designed for kids. And what better way to get a good review of the game than to have an actual kid play it and talk about it with us. So my son, six-year-old Logan, will be with us discussing Echo Jr. when we come back. We're going to play which track right now? We are going to be playing Seal Rocks or The Enchanted Sea. This track plays during both of those. All right, so let's take a listen to Seal Rocks and The Enchanted Sea.
All right, welcome back. That was Seal Rocks and the Enchanted Sea from the game Echo Jr. for the Sega Genesis. That was released in 1995, developed by Appaloosa Interactive, and published by Sega. Composed by Andy Armour, Gebor Fultan, and Laszlo Fazekas. Uh, so this is a game that gets a really bad reputation from a lot of reviewers on YouTube nowadays, unfortunately. It and does. I think it's because they're not really seeing it through the eyes of a child. And no, it's true. I think that the best way to probably get a, a good, accurate view of how this game is supposed to be is to actually see it through the eyes of a child. So we have our second and probably youngest uh, VG ambassador on the show <laughs> with us today. This is Mr. Logan. Welcome, sir. And how old are you, Logan? Six. How old are you going to be in like a week? Um, seven. Good. That's logical. If you were going to be eight, that would be strange. So, tell us a little bit about Echo Jr. Well, it's kind of a kid game, but there is a secret code, which I'm not going to tell. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm, that's right. Because it's secret, and it's only on normal. But if you know the secret code, you could just do the three buttons, and then we'll place you to the settings if you want to make it hard, easy, or normal. Okay, so there's like a secret code to make it a little bit more difficult. Hard has 26, easy has 11, and normal has 17. Yep, these Very are cool. the available levels. Oh, I see. So you're actually unlocking levels when it gets harder, huh? Yeah. Very cool. So so how do you play the game? Like, who, who does the game star? The game that you start with is Echo. Okay. Because he's usually, because the name is called Echo. Right. And Echo has some friends, right? Yeah. Who are they? Kidney and Tara. I see. And what kinds of animals are they? They're both dolphins. I see. But Tara's kind of a killer whale. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so how do you play the game? Well, you use the control pad, which has an up, down, left, and right which makes you move, and then A and B, you can shoot your sonar with, and C can make you go, like, speed up. Oh, so it's your dash button, right? And then you can jump out of the water and stuff? Yes. Very cool. So uh, so Echo's just in the ocean, and he's just swimming around doing nothing? No, you have to figure out quests. Oh, what are the quests like? Like, there's Enchanted Sea, which you have to tag the friends with the glyphs. Oh, okay. And when you do, you have to shoot a big glyph to to win the game. I see. So each level is like a different kind of puzzle that you need to figure out? Yes. Okay. So Emily, why don't you explain that a little bit more detail? From the from the adult side? <laughs> so I think um, I think the reason why Echo Jr. gets panned is not only because the reviewers aren't looking at it from the eyes of a child, but they don't realize that the game was specifically designed to be a parent-child experience, which I think is really special and really brilliant. I can't think of any other game off the top of my head that was designed to be that way. Yeah. Um, if you read the manual, the manual has sort of the beginning section that describes things as normal and it has coloring pages and connect the dots. And then there's sections that speak directly to the parents that say things like, Echo Jr. is a game for parents and children to share. It's been designed especially to give you and your children plenty of opportunity to explore and play. So, Can't get much more direct than that. Right, I know. <laughs> so what Logan was explaining with the uh, the secret code that brings you to a setting screen, the game allows the adult to change the settings to make the experience more catered to their kid. I mean, I think they were really ex expecting kids even younger than Logan to be playing. Maybe this was going to be the first game yeah. that your kid would be playing. So you can... Um, it's not only adjusted by difficulty, but you can have the game sort of auto do things for you. You can turn the goals off entirely, so it's just a free swim. So it kind of can give a, a kid a chance to just figure out how to even work a Get controller. Get used to how Echo works. Exactly, yeah. and just you know have a good time and have a really positive experience. Um, but I really love this this concept of a game designed for a parent and a kid to do together, because obviously when we were growing up, all the advertising was about this is a kid thing. Adults don't get it, you know? Right. So I love thinking, and obviously, you know, 
you and Logan play games together all the time, and plenty of people I know who are parents play games with their kids all the time, but um, it's just cool that this game was specifically designed to be that bridge and to give, to kind of bring kids in with a really good starting experience. Yeah, so so what happens when you shoot your sonar? So if you're looking for a friend on the screen and, and you shoot your sonar, what happens? It comes back and like, it makes a sound that makes it so that it's easier. And there's also like things that you have to find on like the top left corner, but when they blink and the sonar touches you, they blink and so that you know it's them. I see. So you have a little icon on the top of the screen that tells you what kind of object you're looking for. Yes. And when you shoot the sonar, the sonar will come back to you in the direction that your friend or your or the thing you're looking for is, right? And then you've got to figure out how to get to that side of the screen. So it can come from like the top left of the screen and then you have to figure out how to get to the top left of the map to find it. Yes. Yes. And then when you find it, it goes over to the right. The icon goes to the top right of the screen, right? And then once you get them all, then you see the little glyph icon on the screen and that means that you can go to the glyph to end the level. Yes. Very cool. Very easy to understand, right? Did you find any parts of Echo Jr. confusing? Not really. No? What about the music? What did you think about the music? It was a good soundtrack. <laughs> yeah? Do you like the song that's playing now? Yeah. What's your favorite part about it? It's like, it's nice, and it's also like relaxing that you can just hear it. Yeah, there's no creepy music in Echo Jr., right? Not like in the first couple games. Yeah, there kind of is. There is a couple kind of There kind of is. There's yeah. one. Yeah. At least one. Uh, but that actually, if I can jump in, Logan, that's something that I think is really special about the soundtrack, and it's why uh, we picked this particular tune is because I think this tune kind of uh, epitomizes taking the echo sound but repurposing it in a in a friendly way. Yeah. So they use the same soundscape and they use the same ear feel, uh, but it's a happier tune and it's relaxing like Logan is talking about so you know you're not stressed out the entire time. There's no oxygen meter in this game which is probably the biggest the biggest relaxing change you can have <laughs> is not having to worry about drowning every two minutes. Yeah, Echo is fully super powered in this game. It's true. And the two of the composers on this game had worked on Echo titles in the past. Gabor Fulton and Laszlo Fazekas had both worked on the Game Gear version of Echo Tides of Time, so they did have that kind of Echo the Dolphin feel that they could bring to this this title, so it kind of explains why the, the music would sound a little bit similar. Yep. So, anything else you want to tell us about Echo Jr. before we listen to the next track? Well, there's also no health meter. That's true. That's true. So you can pretty much just play and play until you beat the level, right? Yeah. Yeah. Were the levels easy or difficult? Like, if you put it on hard, they're hard. Yeah. If you put it on easy, it's easy. Well, that makes a lot of logical <laughs> sense. And normal, normal. Okay. Would you recommend other kids to play this game? Yeah. Yeah? If they're interested in it. Yeah. Did you have fun playing it with me? Yes. Did you have fun playing it with Emily? Yep. Awesome. It was a good time. Who's your favorite character of the three? Kidney. Kidney. Why Kidney? Because his sonar is nice, and he's... Like a darker color than Echo. Mm. Yeah, each each dolphin has their own sound when they emit their, their song or their sonar. That's such a cool detail yeah. that they put that. I think the best way to describe Echo Jr. is that this is the game everyone thought they were getting when they were playing that first sequence yes. in the first Echo game. exactly. So when they realized that kids just spend all their time trying to do the somersaults and eating fish and stuff, they were like... Let's just do more of that. Right. Let's make a whole game of that. People wanted it, let's give it to them. Yeah, and it's it's an enjoyable time. You don't have to be a kid to enjoy it. I like it. I'm highly biased, but, you know. Ironically, they gave the people what they originally wanted, and everybody hated it. I guess. <laughs> I don't actually know. <laughs> not what, hated it, but, know you know, didn't appreciate it. I don't know what the didn't, reviews didn't were like at the time. It. Yeah, like yeah. modern reviews that I see I now. Think, I think, you know, when it originally came out, you know... Video games was still a kid thing, but it was an older kid thing. So there weren't a lot of parents out there that were really interested in playing these games with their kids. Right. And it's ironic that nowadays, all of us adults that are parents of kids like Logan have grown up with the Genesis games. So now we're playing them 
as parents with our kid. You know, it's like the game was designed a generation too early. Right. Which is yes. funny. I know. That's interesting. And I so. think that, you know, people in our generation are specifically looking to have that experience with their kids. Yeah, for sure. Like they'd want to have it be a co-op family experience kind of evidenced by how many friends of mine I have who are parents who bought a Switch because they knew they could play it with their, yeah, you know, yeah, two-year-olds sure. and three-year-olds, so. All right, so we've got one more Echo Jr. title in the playlist. This is kind of an obscure one. So Sega released a little console called the Sega Pico, and it was kind of like a laptop designed for very young kids, and it came with a kind of a touch stylus and a couple buttons on it, very brightly colored. Uh, essentially, as far as the insides go, it was a Sega Genesis, but with only that Sega PSG as the sound chip, the one that came on the, the Game Gear and the Master System. So we're going to play a track from the Sega Pico edition of Echo Jr. And this is the main hub song that plays when you're swimming around going to your other puzzle levels. So let's take a listen to that. This one's composed by Attila Hager. Alright, that was the super rare gameplay slash hub track from the Sega Pico version of Echo Jr. And that was composed by Attila Hager. Uh, the reason why I say rare is because it's really hard to find this soundtrack on the web, even on YouTube or, you know, your various video game music soundtrack sites. Uh, I really had to actually play the game and record it from the game itself to be able to get the music to play on the show. So it's cool to be able to share something like this that not a lot of people have heard before. Thank and you such for a... doing this oh, because I didn't absolutely. have a way of listening to it. Did you know there was a Pico game before I, I did. Okay. I did. And but I, I didn't know that it was a completely different game from the Echo Jr. that was on the Genesis. Oh nice, yeah, yeah. And it's great that there are these little hidden gems in here. I mean this is such a beautiful piece. And, uh, you know, not many people hear it, and if they are hearing it, they're probably little kids. And if they're little kids, they're probably not even waiting until the song gets all the way through. And I didn't even realize the song had, like, a, a nice little flourish at the end before it starts. So you were really digging this one. Oh, man, we had a different track lined up, and we were just playing this game. And this came up, and I was like, Ed, can you please get me that one? <laughs> Is it too much trouble? Please! I love that one so much. So he... We got we got lucky and he was able to capture it. Was this one of your favorite ones, Logan? Yeah. Yeah. What do you like about this track? The music is like nice and calm. Like you don't even have to play the game. You could just listen to the music. Mm. Did yes. you like playing the game? What kind of games were there in the in Echo Junior Pico? 
There was like a glyph one that there was like you could make them different ones, and then like you can make them different notes. You can play music with the glyphs. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What about the、uh, crab stacking one? Oh, it's kind of like you have to get them up to ten or like up to one, two, three, four. So you control echo. So the Pico originally had, like I said before, like a touchpad with a stylus.、Uh, we're playing it on an emulator here, so we're actually using the mouse as like a stylus with some buttons on the keyboard as you know、uh, the buttons that are on the the Pico unit itself. So you could kind of drag echo around with your with your mouse on the screen. And then you can pick up the crabs and put them into a different pile, and you'd have little voice samples that tell you one plus two equals three, and then you'd take a crab off, and it would be like three minus one equals two, and you'd put it back down, and it would do another equation. So it would kind of tell you the math that you were doing as you were moving the crabs around, right? Yes. Pretty neat. This seems to be an, an edutainment title. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are very mild amounts of challenge here, and I think it was mostly. To get kids into the Echo series, you know, so it's it's a unique series in that there is an Echo for everybody from like age three. That's true. Up to you know seventy. <laughs> That's however, true. However, off you know old you can get before your thumbs start failing you. Right. So there's a challenge for everybody there, which is pretty cool.、Uh, the Pico wasn't very successful in the U.S., but was extremely successful in Japan. So there were like two hundred something Pico games released. Overseas, whereas we only got, I think, thirty or something like that, and even then they were very simple, not very well produced games. But there were some pretty cool ones that came out in the Japanese market. Echo Junior was one of those that you know got released in both. Fortunately, so we were able to to get some gameplay in a language we can understand over here, right? Yes. Yeah. So, what was your favorite part of the game that you played? The glyph one. The glyph one where you can make your own songs. Yes. Yeah. So you click on the glyph and it would do like.、Uh, Frere Jaca. What were some of the other songs? Do you remember? Um, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Do re mi. Yep, do re mi. And there was London Bridge. So a couple of very simple kids songs. And then you can make your notes, your own notes, all over the screen. Yes. Yeah. So pretty cool. Attila Hager. He's kind of significant because not only did he do the Pico Junior game, but he also worked on the next game we're going to be talking about, which is Echo Defender of the Future, and that came out on the Dreamcast. But he was an employee. Of、uh, Appaloosa and Novo Trade between 1992 and 2001, he was one of their in-house composers, and he had a chance to work with lots of the platforms that they worked on,、uh, from the Dreamcast all the way down to the Genesis. He worked on titles like、um, The Contra Adventure, Jurassic Park: Lost World, Museum Madness, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. Three Dirty Dwarves on the PC, Saturn, and PlayStation. Tiny Tank on the PlayStation. So just about every single system, he at least had some of a hand on, and a bunch of games for the Pico as well, like Smart Alex and Smart Alice, Crayola Games, and Winnie the Pooh and Mickey Mouse. In addition to Echo Junior. So、um, he's been working for a Danish-based video game developer, Interactive Vision, since February of 2002. So he's been doing some some games for them. As well, so he's got a pretty impressive career. You look at, you know, some of his bio pages, and he's got like thirty something video games that he's been working on since 1992. So,、uh, but he did a lot of the cinematic music for Echo Defender of the Future.、Mm -hmm. So the craziest thing about actually playing Echo Junior on Pico just five minutes ago was that we found a track in there that was、oh, an、yeah. arrangement of a track from one of the other Echo games, and it was. The most unexpected track. It actually took me a second to figure out what it was because it just it, it didn't make any sense to me that it could be that one. For a split second, there was a remixed or arranged version of the Machine song from the first Echo game. So probably one of the most evil and foreboding songs. The most is in like the most childish. Yes, the, the thing that gave me nightmares when I was nine. Interesting. They decided of all the tracks in the game to adapt. They picked that one, and I almost—I would like to think in my head I've created this this idea that the composer was told, "Yeah, you can arrange any of these," and he listened to them, and he was like, "I'm gonna take that one and turn that into a kids' track <laughs> and show the world what I can do." Really bizarre,、yeah. listeners. Definitely, if you have a chance, grab Echo, put in all ends, listen to the track that comes up in that level, and then think about that being in a kids' game where you're like adding crabs. 
Yeah. And and then putting sea life on a seesaw to make even numbers and stuff. <laughs> I think you only really hear the beginning of the music and it yeah, only too. plays like so between like the hub world and the actual mini games, you see it like a single screen echo just kind of swims from left to right or right to left. And so it only plays for like a good ten seconds or so, not even. So just yeah, like the even. intro. So I'm I'm curious it would be interesting to see if I could like pause the emulation, but not the music yeah, somehow, the and file. see if the rest of the music is actually in the game. Because I'd like to hear the rest of it, but you're, it it just it stops and goes to another screen before the music plays fully. So funny. We'll have to see if we can do that somehow. More, we're just peeling back more layers and finding these incredible things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the next game. This is. Echo, Defender of the Future. This is a Dreamcast game that came out without Ed Annunziata's direction. So this is kind of like a Echo game that's not really canon. And we'll, we'll kind of explain some of uh, the reasons behind that when we come back. So which track did you pick for this game? I picked the track Perils of the Coral Reef, Maine. There are different versions of Perils of the Coral Reef. Makes sense. So let's give it a listen. This was composed by Tim Fallon and Attila Hager.
All right, that was Perils of the Coral Reef from Echo, Defender of the Future. This game was released on June 16th in the year 2000. The Futuristic Year 2000. Developed by Appaloosa Interactive and published by Sega. This particular track was composed by Tim Fallon, and Attila Hager helped out on the cinematics. So he was also the composer of the Echo Jr. Pico track. This is... it's hardly a song it's more like a soundscape yeah it's a good uh, description and, and and tim fallen really started doing these kind of tracks when he was working on games like equinox on the snes where they were very like little incidental musical interludes here and there but a lot of ambient sound and a lot of sound effects going on and he kind of carried this into this game and this is a really good example of that kind of music that he does uh, if anyone doesn't know, if anyone isn't a, a listener of like Pixel Tunes Radio, my my other VGM podcast show, Tim Fallon is uh, one of my favorite composers of all time. So head back to episodes 69 and 96, which coincidentally were both of my Tim Fallon episodes, where we cover within both of those episodes uh, the man's whole career from his early days on the ZX Spectrum up into... Basically, only a couple games after this, he uh, composed, I think, Lemmings for the PSP after this one, and then uh, retired completely from video game music composition. So this was this was one of the culminating soundtracks of, of Tim's entire career. So what was your opinion on this track? Why did you pick it as your Defender of the Future track? Honestly, a lot of the reason why I picked this one was because it was one of the shortest ones mm. that existed. Because since I really liked your description of soundscapes, since a lot of them are these soundscapes, they go on for five minutes, six minutes, and I sort of wanted something that was a little bit tighter, I guess. A little more concise. Yeah, and I felt like this was a good example of that, and I also thought that this in particular showed off the different ear feel going on, because not only is the composition different from a lot of echo things technically, in the sense of notes and such, but the instrumentation feels very different to me yeah definitely i don't know how to explain it but it feels like brighter sunnier like the water is clearer <laughs> something there's that kind of um like i don't know is that pearl drop is that what you call that synth yeah you know i think a lot of it probably has to do with just the fact that it's later you know it's like almost 10 years after the original echo red book tracks were recorded and so technology is just better there's more digital filters there's more digital production um we're working with more higher quality synths and i think maybe a lot of the sounds that you know spencer nilsson may have wanted to get into the original echo games just the technology wasn't there to create those easily and and with with tim's equipment he was just able to do that a little more effectively to to capture that kind of underwater uh filter that not a lot of other people were able to do i'm gonna say possibly but i do think there were some very specific decisions in instrumentation that are departures like mm. that guitar wail oh the yeah for sure completely different no and that's a very fallen thing too so i yeah, guarantee yeah. you that, that and was... I'm, we're not you know the that i don't know what you would call that I feel like it's a pearl drop, but I can't remember. We'll but call whatever it a plinky is plunky plunky, plunky plunky, whatever is <laughs> making the what you would call, I guess, the main melody, which is just that da 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 da. I mean, they could have gone with a bell or a chime, and I feel like that would have been more in keeping with what had been done in previous Echo titles. You're definitely right about it being like super produced and sounding much wider, kind of and denser, mm. but. That peeling guitar, <laughs> something about that that <laughs> really just kind of comes out of nowhere. Really changes the the feel of the experience, I think, which is also appropriate because this game was completely different. Yeah. Say, so, Logan, what did you think about this track? It's nice and calm. Yeah, nice and calm. You think a lot of the tracks are nice and calm. That's because they are nice and calm. You like the chill echo tunes. Yeah. Do you prefer a track like this, or do you like like chip tunes, like the Sega Genesis tracks? Um, I like both. You like them both. Good answer. I like them both, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, does this sound like a game that you'd want to play sometime? This is Echo the Dolphin, but it's like 3D, like Mario Odyssey is. That sound cool to you? Yeah. Yeah? Maybe we'll play it sometime. So, this is a lot different from the other Echo games, specifically because, uh, like we mentioned before, Ed Annunziata did not work on this game. So, how does this game kind of differ in, in format and form from the original Echo games. Well, let me talk about the similarities first. 
So you still have the alien race that's trying to destroy life on Earth. They are now called the Foe. They're not called the Vortex, but you still have this alien threat. You have Echo, who's the chosen dolphin to kind of protect his kind. You have an ancient creature, question mark, that is sort of analogous to the asteroid, but not quite, because I don't think it's sentient, but it's called the Guardian, and it protects the, the ocean by projecting some kind of protective field over it, and that's what the foe is trying to destroy so they can get into the Earth. But I think the biggest departure is that humans are a huge presence in this game, and I really wanted to talk about this because I think this is really interesting. In the the mainline Echo games, even in Echo Jr., humans are conspicuously absent. Sometimes you see a sunken ship, and in the city of Atlantis you see, um, you know, like Greek or Roman statues around. So Mm. you know humans have been here at some point, but you don't actually really know when this game is taking place and you don't know if humans are really a part of the landscape anymore. Interesting. Yeah, and I think that that's very interesting. So by contrast, Defender of the Future starts with a cinematic that explains that dolphins and humankind have united into some kind of society together, so they support each other. And I guess what the foe is trying to do is the foe is trying to go back in time and disrupt this societal union between humans and dolphins so that each can be conquered separately. It's actually a really cool idea. I mean, I, when I got the game, obviously I was looking for more of what I loved about Echo. So I get this and I find out right away that there is no asteroid and that was a big minus. Yeah, no, I can imagine. So I was really kind of gutted by that. And then humans were a big deal. And I tend to, in my sci-fi, if we're dealing with other alien races or we're viewing a story through a different perspective that isn't human, I do get a little disappointed when humans get kind of shunted in as very important because we have so many stories like that right, where right. humans are the chosen yeah. ones and all that so it's i kind of like I this was... new team was like desperate to like how are we going to make people relate to the dolphin kind and of. like to, we have to add humans in here somehow maybe so i was kind of put off by it i tried playing it it was very difficult uh, it was one of the first you know 3d games that i really sank my teeth into and had to go through that learning process so i kind of just i didn't get very far and I sort of lost my enthusiasm for continuing. However, in doing research for the show, I'm like really inspired to get back into this and to try. Very, very interesting. Yeah, we'll have to check this game out in the future and I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of experiencing it. And, and now, now that I know more about what the previous Echo games are about and how they're played to kind of compare that to what they did with, with Defender of the Future. I know it's had kind of mixed reviews. Some people enjoy it and some people just flat out panned it yeah uh, and I really think that that has a lot to do with how much of a fan they were of the original games yeah. to begin with so if I guess if you look at it as a kind of a separate entity coincidentally starring a dolphin named Echo you might have a slightly different opinion of it based on that instead of trying to fit it into you know your traditional Echo timeline right it's just a reimagining of the world and I think as an adult I'm much more capable of doing that without getting upset because as a kid, you're just like, no, this is my thing. <laughs> what happened to my thing? Yeah. I wanted it just the way I wanted it. Exactly. And then hopefully when you get to be an adult, you can be like, yeah, okay, this is a cool, this is definitely a cool, different artistic interpretation of a story that I loved. And it's worth appreciating in its own way. Exactly. I think I'm really stuck on this idea of soundscape. I really like that you described it as soundscape. And I think that the music is very suited to the fact that this game, this echo game is in 3D. So... It feels maybe like less of a game than any of the other titles because you're just a dolphin in the ocean and it's much less clear what you have to do. And Mm. it's a very realistic game. I think it's considered one of the most realistic looking games on the Dreamcast. And so I think that the music really fits that in that maybe some of the gametization is taken out of the experience and some of the gametization is taken out of the VGM. Right. No, that makes total sense. You know, it's it's like what you'd hear in your ears if you were to dive underwater and hear all these kind of bubbly sounds around you instead of necessarily hard rock tracks of time right, to time yeah. or, or, you know, like flashback style bass lines of, of the original Echo game. So uh, it makes sense. I think they definitely were going for kind of a realism, kind of an immersive yeah. yes, experience. Absolutely. And uh, to kind of drive that whole storyline home, so very cool. I, it's it's unfortunate, you know, it did get a remake or a re-release on the PS2 later on, but after that, Sega just kind of dropped the whole Echo 
storyline and, yeah. and the whole franchise all together. And uh, but like we said before, you know, Ed Anunziata, he's got the rights to Echo back, and we're gonna hopefully see if he's got anything cooking. I know he's spoken about not being able to speak about Echo, so that might be a good sign that there's there's something cooking and he just can't give out any information on it. Oh, I hope so. Uh, rather than talking about it as if it was something that happened in the past, so. I hope so. Let's keep our ears and dorsal fins towards the future. <laughs> Logan is looking at me like, Dad, that's a terrible joke. <laughs> so I want to thank you both for helping me on my very first episode of the VG Embassy. Oh, thanks having, for having us at uh, the headquarters. It's yes, very exciting. Nice having digs. you guys as VG ambassadors was a great joy, and I'm so glad that we got to learn more about the Echo series. So there will be many more episodes like this where I will have a guest VG ambassador on with me, teaching us all about their favorite games and aspects of video game culture. And I want all of these shows to be different. So when I invite a guest on, I'm pretty much going to give them carte blanche to decide what kind of show they want to do. So if, for instance, uh, I have a friend that's a really big fan of the VGM Jukebox, and he wants to do a podcast full of uh, fan or listener picks, we might do a show like that. If I have, for instance, uh, Robert Purnell on from the Rhythm and Pixels podcast, and they really like single game episodes like Pixelated Audio does, and they want to do a show that's in the style of Pixelated Audio, then we can do something like that. We're a very community-based embassy here, and I owe a lot to the VGM Podcasts group on Facebook. It's called VGM Podcast Fans. You can search for it on Facebook, and it's a huge and fantastic community full of people who enjoy video game music, enjoy the podcasts that feature video game music. You'll find both fans and hosts of VGM Podcasts on there, and uh, I really want to incorporate as much of that community as I can in this podcast. Basically, talking about our passion. As far as a release schedule goes, I'm gonna aim for one episode every week for at least the first few episodes, and then as things go on, uh, I'll try to keep that schedule, but if not, it might be a little bit less than one a week. We'll figure it out. Uh, as far as social media goes, you can check us out at facebook.com slash groups slash the VG Embassy, or you can catch us on Twitter at the VG Embassy. You can find the show on iTunes as well. If you do download this podcast through iTunes, please give us a, uh, a review and a rating. If you could, that would help our show's visibility and uh, help more people discover it. Uh, Patreon, I'm still working on. I'm still working on the details for that, so I will have more information on that in the future, as well as uh, tiers and what bonuses you guys might be able to get for the different Patreon levels. And I am looking forward to bringing you guys more episodes. Again, thank you, Logan, for being on the show with me. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you, Emily, for being on the show with me. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> And I am, you know, I know that VGM Jukebox is winding down and you are always welcome to come hang out with me at the VG Embassy. I hope that you become kind of a regular here because we, I know we both have kind of a mutual respect for each other as far as uh, podcasting and just friendship goes. So it's it's great to always hang out with you and maybe sometime we'll bring you on a show and I'll teach you about some stuff instead of the oh, other way around. Cool. Well, thank you. I am very excited about that invitation, but I think you're going to have to wait to hear some feedback from your fans <laughs> before you decide whether or not you're going to have me back. Uh, either way, I had a great time. So anyways... Thank you for letting me talk about Echo for two hours. I, I, how many knows, hours? Who knows how long? We started <laughs> recording the show at, what, 10 a.m.? We, mm -hmm. we did a break for lunch, and now it's 3 p.m., so it's been five hours of Echo, Echo, Echo all day long. So much How do you feel echo. about that, Logan? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, guys. Thank you for visiting the VG Embassy. We will see you next time. Our closing track is Time Travel from Echo 1. Uh, Emily, why did you choose this as our closing track today? I chose this because I felt like we could not have an Echo podcast without playing this track. The time travel element is so important in the entire series, and... This track always accompanies the time travel mechanic. So it shows up in both Echo 1 and Echo 2, The Tides of Time. I guess it's the closest you're going to get to a signature tune from the series. Awesome. Thank you again for listening to the VG Embassy. Tell your friends. 
if you have friends that like video game music and, you know, we want to get the word out for the show as, as best as possible to bring our listener base up, to have more contributions to our show, to grow this community. So we would love it if you guys, uh, you know, spread the show by word of mouth. I would really appreciate that. I'm and, always super excited about shows that are community based. So yeah. I'm really excited to see what comes out of this all right and maybe i'll get a bunch of logan's classmates to listen to we'll have a bunch of six-year-old fans yeah have them on we'll talk about echo again. yeah we'll get a whole class together <laughs> a whole we'll, school we'll talk about get Yoshi. It? school a school of fish a school students. of students yeah yeah <laughs> he's rolling his eyes at me blame this guy dad his jokes influence. all right we will see you next time on the vg embassy thanks for listening bye everybody bye <laughs> We do really need to find we the title. We do really need to find the title. Uh, I could. This is when I tapped out on my... Track 11. Wait, what? Track 11? It's track 9. Hmm. That's weird. We're on track 8 right now.